Beautiful. Hello, oh, hello, yeah. everyone. I think we're live. We got uh, Josh got this new there video capture card, and we're trying that with the iPad today. So if there's any little issues, let us know. Otherwise, I think we're we're pretty good. So ah, there we are. Oh my did it work? Gosh, yeah. Oh. Hello, hello, everyone. <gasps> I think we're live. We got uh, Josh got this new video. Okay. Right. Get the one oh. technical error out of the way, out the gate. Uh, so, officially, hi everyone, I'm Timothy Von Rieden, better known as Von Art Online, and I'm joined by my fellow, well, I guess boyfriend Josh, and fellow streamer today and moderator, Josh, and today we're going to be working on the Queen of Hearts. We're going to continue the train of working on a different card every week. Last week we did the Jack of Clubs, and I can't really show you, or can you do full screen really quick? Oh, like the camera? Yeah. Oh, weird, you see the green screen get darker. <laughs> oh! We're in the ether. Um, oh, there oh. we go. <laughs> the fireplace is back. <laughs> back when everyone was saying that my head was on fire on that one stream. So I guess we could live with this. Do you guys like it better with like a background or do you like it better where we just edit out the green screen? But anyways, <laughs> um, this is the Jack of Clubs card that I officially finished earlier this week. And then uh, I started working on the Jack of Spades, or actually the King of Spades. And if you're my Patreon backer, you can see what that one looks like. But today we're doing the Queen of Hearts. Actually, Josh, you know what? You can use the poll option on YouTube. Oh, that's right. And officially, hi, everyone. Welcome, welcome. If you have any comments or questions during this live stream, please put at Von Art or at Schwa, and we will do our best to answer them. And then also, if you want to put where you're watching from, we will do the shout outs, kind of like how we used to do it. Uh, I think that's something I I like seeing where everyone's from. And then it kind of lets me get started on this. And then we can get going here. So yes, hello. Happy Wednesday, everyone. Hope you're all doing well. We have a lot to talk about today. And I'm just going to jump right into the actual drawing while you guys are logging in. So we're working on the Queen of Cups, or the Queen of Hearts. Oh, I've been doing too much tarot lately. The Queen of Hearts and... Gosh, I hate that keyboard so much. It's so loud. I can't think when I hear it. It's like... <laughs> okay, oh, because well, you can't do it on the... Oh, that's why. I... So technically my fault, actually, with that one. Oh, yeah, I can't do it there. Uh, so for the Queen of Hearts, my original drawing for her was just like a, a pretty simple pose, but I've done sketches of her like the past two months. And the idea is uh, the heart suit is going to be based on the Pacific Ocean. And the story behind the suit of hearts is it's going to be a dad and his twins. So a girl and a boy twin. And they lost their mom. And that's part of the story that I'm creating with all of these suits. There's like a, a tragedy in each one. So in this one, you have the daughter kind of stepping up to fulfill the queen duties. And I like the idea that the twins are still a little younger. So both the Jack and the Queen, they're going to look a little younger, probably like 15 maybe like 15 to 18 range uh so definitely teenagers and then the dad i want to definitely be like 40s um definitely an older uh kind of more worn looking uh merman but for the queen this was my original pose and then after talking with some of you guys on the uh patreon discord uh specifically uh there were a lot of good examples of like changing the pose to kind of also represent the the pip, so in this case, the heart. So a lot of like dancing movements. And I thought about who she was as a character. And I don't think she would just be in this very like static pose. Because if she's supposed to be like a young, flowy teenager, I started playing with uh, it this morning, actually, of like maybe more like lucidness. And then they're looking in the opposite direction, the kind of idea of that we don't always look before we leap when we're younger. And then I kind of created something like this. It has a little bit more of that movement I'm looking for, but I like the idea that she's like pointing one way, but she's looking another. So it kind of is depicting the youth aspect in this, and I, I really wanted it very flowy, because even though the club's suit are going to be like waves upon waves upon waves in terms of their uh, tail fins and fins, I wanted the hearts to be just very soft, very inviting, and it's supposed to be a very welcoming looking uh, suit, all three of them. So for her, I really need her to be like the standout because she's going to have the biggest hair, I think, in the series as well. And I want all of her hair to be reminiscent of hearts. And you'll kind of see how we're going to work with that today. And then obviously the tail uh, fin also has a little heart uh, pip included in it. So this is going to be kind of the starting point foundation. I'll start doing the more finished 
or the more like uh, edging and line art sketching on the stream today. And then I'll try to do as much details as I can. And then normally I will print this out at like a 2% opacity because some of you are like, why are you working digitally? So for things like this, I like working digitally because it has the true flip built into Procreate. So I could go on and on about this, but essentially this is what we're going to be working on today. Uh, obviously you don't have to ask any questions about the card specifically or what I'm working on. You can ask us anything about life, uh, questions about what it takes to be an art business. And yeah, we'll go from there. Maybe just fun things. Because I know we definitely want to talk about uh, a movie specifically we saw last night. I have another new book I want to show you guys. And then eventually Josh can talk about his piano updates. So oh, geez. let's get started. So you can do the shout outs where people are from and I'll start yes. doing this. Hello, everyone. We have Tijel here with us today. <gasps> Tijel, Tijel, hello, Tijel, hello. Tijel. Um, Ijader says good evening and greetings from the Netherlands. Oh, hello, Why, hello. hello. Uh, Lucy is here. Hola. Jens is here. Hello. Oscar is here. Hey, yeah. Hello. Hey, hey, Oscar. Felix says, wait, your hair is not curly anymore. Uh, I took a buzzer in the bathroom to it the other day. Well, my hair is very thick. Uh, borderline froey. So when it gets a little too big, it becomes more like a mushroom. Uh, it like it's so curly, it almost just becomes like poofy. Well, you did the um, straightener on like the poofy part in the front, right? Technically, it does make it look a little. This was less like curly. I did it two days ago, and it just holds. It looks good. It's cute. Well, it's but uh, I did I did cut my hair a little bit. It's a little shorter than I normally would like. I don't like when the sides are like so flat against my head, but it'll grow out. Um, do, 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 do. let's see who else we got here right now to let's see what's winning Ooh, it's getting close oh really yeah it's getting close right now fireplace is in the lead though i feel like this is something we'll keep the the poll on for a while uh so yeah if you guys want us to have an actual background here instead of a green screen being kind of deleted uh versus the fireplace <laughs> Tigel says, I think you should use the green screen, but display the normal background. And then sometimes have something weird fly by and act as if there's a ghost. <laughs> mushroom hair. Right. My mushroom. I mean, we could do... We looked at, like, water backgrounds since Tim's drawing mermaids, but none of them were... I don't know, we weren't feeling any of them. They were just so okay. ocean ones. Well, I don't want it to be, like, too distraction or like gimmicky yeah well the water ones do moved it was weird it's almost like you're on a boat oh yeah the camera like zooms in and does like a pull away so we need like a static water one if we even did that <laughs> a link says hi guys from texas hello 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 a uh, says watching from denmark unless the earth, earth watching from denmark unless the earth disappears <laughs> <laughs> ella's here hello ella hey ella Carlos, hi, nice to see you again. Good to see you again, too, Carlos. That's right, Josh. You got to let me know what uh, new emoji you like. Ella sent me the next batch. <gasps> oh, my gosh, Ella. You've been on fire with those. Just like Tim's hair. <laughs> <laughs> is that it? Oh, no. <laughs> cool. That is all our introduction so far. Well, hello, hello. So what is one of the things I wanted to show off Jack Gloves? Oh, okay. So yesterday... Yesterday was kind of crazy. We had uh, my best friend Kat over, and she filmed us the entire day. So from, what, like 9.30ish till 5ish? And we wanted to do a video kind of showing off what a typical workday looks like uh, for both Josh and I. And I think a lot of people are curious of what does it mean to be an independent artist? How do you fit all these projects into your schedule? How do you balance work life and personal life? How do you do shipping and kind of the not so fun business sides of art alongside doing the more creative sides. How do you avoid burnout? There were a lot of good questions that you guys asked and I'm going to do my best to answer as many as I can. Oh, we did a lot of time lapses yesterday. So we're going to kind of show, okay, from 10 to 12, here's where we're at from one to two. Here's where we're at from 220 to 320. This is where I'm usually. And, uh, it might take a little bit of editing cause there's literally eight hours worth of footage. And then like another, probably two hours of B-roll that I can edit in and splice in. And I'm going to do a lot of voiceover talk. And then we'll have Josh do some of his voiceover for his questions. So it'll still probably be a little bit. Uh, but just know that that is something in the works. And 
we're pretty excited about it because I think there's been more of a, a response to the behind the scenes stuff. And even for like Josh was wondering if he should do like what shipping service to use online if you're an artist and uh, even things like of how do you uh, ship or how do you like do packing orders from start to finish on your shipping days. <sighs> no, <laughs> is that I bothering hear, you? Yeah, uh, here's <laughs> on screens. <laughs> uh, so yeah. I'm pretty excited. If there's any other type of video like that you'd want us to see or like you have a genuine interest in wanting to see um, that isn't necessarily focused on the actual art making side, more on like the behind the scenes stuff, uh, we would love to know more because I think we're going to try to get more into the um, video side of uh, our careers. We shall see. We shall see. I mean, I think the... It's going to be a lot of editing with this one, though. Because that's what, it was like eight hours of just straight. That's what, yeah. Oh, yeah, just video. So it's going to be a fun time. Well, I think it's also good for people to see that we also don't have a big team. It's literally just Josh and I. And I think sometimes the presumption is if you have a certain amount of followers on Instagram, like you have a team running it, kind of like Ross or Jazza, or even with like Loesch and Devin having 3D Total do all their book stuff for them. Like we're doing everything ourselves at this point. And it is a lot. And I think having a set amount of time every day dedicated to the not so fun side of art. So the correspondence, the packing, the uh, for me, it would be like golding and then Josh just printing. And there's a lot. And I think it's good that once you recognize that you need to stay organized on top of this, and once you kind of have a system in place, it's way easier. Like right now, if Josh and I got, let's say, 50 orders, we could probably do it in two to three hours oh yeah because everything we know where it, everything's like pre-cut a lot of things are wrapped already the cards are already packed in a box because it's one of our dailies is yeah to we do get stuff prepped. daily mm -hmm. um oh felix says maybe detail what it's like to ship stuff worldwide along packing takes dealing with customs etc uh, yeah nightmare. those are a lot of <laughs> um yeah those are a lot of things that i think people don't always realize too and I feel bad because sometimes we ship things internationally and it can take sometimes two months for packages to arrive for some people just because customs. It's pretty rough right now. Yeah. There's not really much what you can really do about it, honestly, either. Um, except just wait for it to get through customs. But it's a lot of like patience. Oh, my gosh. The vote's at 50-50 right now. <laughs> yeah. So I guess we'll just do a little bit of both then. <laughs> Like I said, we'll wait till the stream's like halfway over and then see where it's at. Or is it that thing that just stays there the whole time? Oh, um, no, it kind of just, but you can see, you can minimize it. Oh, okay. Yeah. That's good. Oops. Oh, I see. I mean, actually. We were nervous the iPad wouldn't look good because we got the new adapter. Oh yeah, but it what does. It, look like? it does look better on the screen. I feel. Oh, yeah. 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 Okay. That's a good. Do we thing. know what we can do then? Since it's at fifty-fifty, let's show what the other one looks like. So show us now in the corner with the fireplace. Okay. And throughout the stream, we'll just go back and forth and kind of see how you guys are feeling oh, about both. We're just both. gonna play around with it. Mm -hmm. Hang on, I think I should have one. I think you do have a preset one. Uh, not with the iPad yet. I can make it though. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so I want a lot of movement with her. And I think I'm doing more of like a clownfish pattern. Uh, not entirely exactly like a clownfish, but definitely with that very soft edges uh, going down the body. Kind of like a koi fish as well. And then she's going to have a darker skin tone. Let me see here. So I want her tail fin to contrast it, and I'm going to have it be a lighter value here. All right, so I feel pretty good about this underdrawing. I'm going to start doing more of a cleanup everywhere. So I can switch to the sketching brush. Let me make sure you guys can see it. Oh, I 
let's see. There we go. Sometimes the little video goes missing. The what's wrong? I'm just trying to find the video. The fireplace noise just doesn't play. It's oh. very strange. Fireplace should not play. Oops. So I guess while you're doing um, all that, I can kind of explain what I'm doing here. So I have my foundation kind of set. I set it at a lower opacity, and then I take a smaller brush, and I outline an area in it that I think would work best for like a final outline. It's still malleable, so I can still change it if I need to, but I'm trying to set more of the actual parameters that I want the outline to be now. Give that twist of the body there. Um, definitely going to give her some kind of a kind of natural bra. I like the aerial effect with just the shells. I might try to think of something, or not even I might. I will think of something more clever, though, to integrate the hearts. I might try to find, uh, unless if you guys may know, like an underwater foliage or flora that look like they're in the shape of a heart. I know I have the uh, the uh, reefs and the kelp that kind of have that appearance. But if there's, maybe I'll do the specific shells and do just kind of line them up so that they create a heart. We'll see. I try to. I want to integrate the pip shape as much as I can in these drawings to really reinforce if someone's playing like a speed game with the cards that it, it's very easily decipherable as the suit so in this case I, I want people to instantly recognize okay this is the heart suit I think that back line's too strong there Where's the fireplace? <laughs> it's weird. It won't show the fireplace for some reason. That is weird. Right, it was doing good a second ago. Well, clearly that's a sign we're going to stay green screen today. Oh, wait. There it is. Okay. A little okay. too wide, but my hair is on fire. <laughs> I think the reason we can't do the fireplace is because I, I look like a literal flamer. Uh, <laughs> you don't like that? No, I like almost like positioning my head so it really looks like I'm on fire. <laughs> oh my gosh. I mean, that's bad. <laughs> Funny, but bad. That's cute. Let's see. Let me stretch a little bit. I wonder if I could, like, move the fireplace for you. I don't know, Ryan. There's not really much space to work with. Yeah, no. It's pretty close I to the edge. That. Hang on, that may make it a little better for you. So I, a lot of the fins and a lot of the side tails that I'm doing here, I'm going to have that very curvy edge. And the clubs has a little bit of the curve too. I know you can't see it as well, but uh, they're a, a little bit more chaotic or like all over the place and that's mixing with a seahorse type body where for this one I definitely wanted to read um, more of like a fish and a very flowy think more of like a beta fish or like a clownfish mix uh, that's kind of look I'm going for smooch on top <laughs> are you still editing that Yes. <laughs> the joys of live stream editing. It's to fit in the box perfectly. I think it's in there now. All right, that looks a little better. <laughs> Let me catch up on comments here. Oops. 
Oops, come on. Um, Tijol says, I'm curious to know your opinion on the new Encanto movie. Encanto. Encanto. The Disney one. Oh, uh, I haven't right. seen it yet. I did. <laughs> YouTube got me on like what to play next, and it played the We Don't Talk About Bruno. No. And that song was in my head all day. I even got Josh stuck. Oh, yeah. Me. <laughs> we don't talk about Bruno. No, no. Um, so I know nothing about it. I know some of my friends saw it. They said it was okay. They said it wasn't something that they would go out of their way to see. Uh, but they said it was still enjoyable for what it was. We did see Sing 2. Uh, and I really liked the original Sing, but I didn't think the sequel was that great. Like, visually, yeah, it's impressive. But every animation studio nowadays... Usually the video, the visuals will be impressive. So I think a lot of it then comes down to story and the pacing and uh, the way that they kind of use cleverness. Look at Astrid. I know. Oh, she's... And Sing 2 felt very much like we want to make money off of a property that did well the first time around. And it just didn't feel great. Um, but I guess that can lead us into our another one is last night, Josh took me to go see Nightmare Alley the new Del Toro film. It was really late. It was like, started at 10, 15. 10, 15, yeah. This is a two and a half hour movie. We so got out at like one o'clock. Basically. We weren't home till one. I think that's why I'm a little disoriented this morning because <laughs> I couldn't not think about it last night. Um, the more I thought about it, the more I'm like, you know, I'm still glad that original films are being made and uh, Del Toro, I still think Pan's Labyrinth is one of like the masterpieces in the final, or in the fantasy genre. But I thought Nightmare Alley was far too long. I think it dragged a lot, and there was a lot of content that just felt like filler for no reason. And I think for that reason, I think it would have performed much better as a mini series. And I think you would have been able to see the main character's growth, uh, Bradley Cooper's character, uh, throughout. And you can kind of see how slowly he becomes more kind of arrogant about the way he is deceiving people and how much he is so drawn to that lifestyle. And the most interesting parts, for sure, for me, were between Kate Blanchett's character and his character in the office that she works in. Loved those scenes a lot. I loved the power play of trying to, like, out-mental each other. It's like a mental gymnastics game, and you're constantly seeing who's winning. That was really fun. But overall, I would say it was just, it was average. It was just average for me. It was, like, say. a 6 out of 10 for me. I would say, like, a I think it five. was. It had me... It captured me enough that i was curious to see what was going to happen even though i some things were predictable but don't want to say too much about i think it. it also did kind of a trope that i'm it really is bothering me now the more that i get into tarot because one of the characters is all about tarot and she's constantly like playing with the cards and at one point she does a reading for the main character and like the the main big bet like future card the outcome was the hanged man uh and they tried to make it sound like it was so devious and horrible but if you guys know what the hangman reading is it's looking at something from a different perspective or like needing to look at something from a new perspective and that could have fit with the story that they were going for him but they were making it seem like it was so bad it was like such a bad card to get like, he's gonna die he's gonna be dead hanging from a tree and i'm like that is not oh, yeah. the meaning of the hangman at well, all i mean the movie's view of tarot was way different than i think tarot's it's they had the more classic, like, mystical tarot where it's the cards are actually telling your your fortune. Well, I like where... that, though. I I would have wanted more of that. Oh, serious? Yeah. I mean, I feel like... I think the issue is they they didn't do research on the cards. Oh, yeah. I mean, they yeah, could have easily done the tower sense. or they could have done, like, the nine or ten of swords like there were so many other cards that could have made more sense well, I, mean, I was happy it wasn't death because i was like they're gonna i thought in that moment <laughs> i thought for the sure death they were card. Gonna i was like death. no but in my mind it's like the hangman was almost just as bad because they're trying to make it seem like oh the hangman's a scary card because it's someone hanging or it's called the hanged man so it sounds like a person was killed and like hung from somewhere uh so i don't know i i had so many mixed feelings about it throughout and I know Josh had to deal with me when we came back because I'm very critical of movies that I feel uh, I, I want to enjoy. And I think you Del don't Toro, hate him. <laughs> I, I hold to a higher standard. I really do. And I think uh, since Pan's Labyrinth, I've always been a little let down from each of his movies. I, I think 
watching Devil's Backbone, I was like, okay, it seems like a weaker Pan's Labyrinth. I would definitely prefer the Pan's Labyrinth because Del Toro said uh, they're supposed to be like a pair or a set of movies. Um, I forget the official term for it, but you're, they're like a companion movies. And then, uh, obviously, I did not care for Pacific Rim very much at all. Mm. Uh, and then Crimson Peak was kind of a letdown for me. And then Shape of Water, I did think was fun. I don't think it deserved Best Picture, but I thought it was a fun movie. And then this one was like, yeah, it's it's, it's good. It, I feel like this is one you could just watch on the couch after it's released on Netflix or something. That's I don't think I, you need think to go see it. Plus, I mean, it was so long. And usually if a movie long. hits after two hours, that's when I'm like, I need to get a break. Pause for a second, so... Well, but Tim's really cute because if he watches a movie that you don't really that you don't really enjoy, he tends to just kind of go quiet for a little bit. You have I do. To like I get, I get no distant. Yeah, you have to kind of think about it. What you prefer they would have done, how they could have <laughs> changed it, made it better. I think I have to accept that this is like existing in the world and that it could have been better. Yeah. And it, it wasn't. But I know this might be nitpicky too. I'm sure a lot of people are like, thinking I'm very nitpicky on movies, but it's only because I care so much. I love movies so much. Uh, I love when movies give you puzzle pieces, and then it's up to you to kind of fit together the pieces to form the puzzle of what you're trying to experience. And there's a lot of films that do this really well. Um, One that a lot of people probably wouldn't like, but I think did it really well is I'm Thinking of Ending Things, where you're constantly getting these weird shaped pieces, and you're like, how the hell does this fit into the puzzle that I'm watching right now? And then by the end, you only are given about half the pieces, and it's up to you and like your creativity to fill in the missing pieces. Where this movie very much felt like <laughs> it was a two-piece puzzle, and they'd give you one of the pieces, and they're like, oh, I wonder what the next piece will be. And then they give you the other piece, you're like, oh, is, is this the puzzle? Like, this is what you wanted me to do? And it just kept happening over and over. There was one point where I started to realize every dialogue that pointed out an object or something, that object was going to be reinforced and reintroduced later on to have meaning. But after the first few times, I'm like, okay, they got to stop doing this. And the way that it ended, you it's so predictable that I... I, maybe that's for me then. Maybe I, I need a little level of you have to figure things out on your own or they're more challenging to watch as a viewer. When things are spoon fed, I think I get really upset because I'm like, I feel like I'm being treated like I'm lacking <laughs> in the brain compartment. Um, it's still a fun watch though, so I don't want to be too harsh on it. And I think Kate Blanchett did an excellent job as a the therapist. Uh, and I thought Bradley Cooper did what he could with the movie. Uh, but I think it should have gone to a younger role because everyone was talking to his character as if he was younger. And I felt like that would have played out better because uh, the way that it played out, it didn't seem like it fit the age and the narrative they were going for him. And also I thought Rooney Mara's character was just a complete waste of time. Uh, I don't know why they threw a love interest without some kind of deeper meaning behind it. It just felt like it was there just to be there. On another note, though, there's a trailer for Death on the Nile, and I'm going to watch that one. I don't know how you feel about those. Did you like the new Murder on the Orient Express? It was fine. I love the old one. I think that was a good movie. I but... like murder mystery stuff. I like solving things, but I saw the original, or the, uh, I guess, yeah, the original Murder on the Orient Express, like the 1939 movie. I forgot what year it came out. So I already knew what was going to happen. Oh, yeah, you knew. Uh, I never read Death in the Nile, though, so I have no idea what that book. Murder in the Orient Express I did, but I don't know with Death in the Nile. Because I think when it comes to those type of movies, I think you have to avoid spoilers at all costs. I would even avoid watching trailers at this point. That's what I've been kind of influencing Josh, is if there's a movie you know you're going to like, or at least that you want to see, whether it's from like a director you really like or you've, you heard of the type of genre of movie it's going to be, Avoid the trailer. I avoided the French Dispatch. I've avoided the new Bell movie from the guy that directed Summer Wars that we'll probably see soon. And it just makes the viewing experience so much better because you're not waiting then for images that you saw in the trailer that you're like waiting for them to pass through. Instead, the whole thing's just fresh. And I I prefer that uh, way of going to see movies now. Oh, yeah. I'm going to catch up on some comments here. Oh, yes. Do, do, 
Tefalina, hello from the Great Wide North. Hello, Tefalina. Hello, hello. Um, all right, here we are. Uh, Jen says, are there any animals that you just haven't or refuse to draw because it frightens or disgusts you? Yeah. <laughs> um, disgust is a strong word. I know. Disgust is a strong word. <laughs> um, I don't think I would be opposed to drawing any animal. I'm trying to think of like an animal. Is there one that you have actively avoided that you can think of? Um, no, because even shark or like things that I would think I would be more scared of, like snakes or sharks, um, not really spiders, I guess, even though I love spiders, I don't, especially like a tarantula, it doesn't seem like the most fun for me to draw. Well, maybe, I don't know. Yeah, I don't think there's any animal that I'd be afraid to draw. Oh, I think if they were uh, anthropomorphic in any way, I would avoid that. I think because it has such a connection now to the furry community and I am... Not really about that life at all, so I would say that would be the only thing I would avoid. So if like there was a wolf standing on his hind legs, probably wouldn't be drawing that. <laughs> uh, but every other animal, I would say I'm not. Yeah, I'm not against any. Uh, Carlos says I never know which size of canvas to use on Procreate. I work on A4 300 PPI. You might know more of what that is. I honestly I do whatever the standard canvas size is, although. To be honest, I think you could go for a higher resolution if you're planning on taking it from start to finish in digital. Because if you zoom in, you can you can definitely see the pixels on my lines. But for me, I'm only using Procreate as like a means to an end. And this will be a very, very light, rough uh, foundation for me to actually pencil on top of. So yeah, I would, if you're going to be trying to paint digitally and you want a nice, good resolution that you can blow up to be like a giant print size or a banner. Yeah, I would work at a higher resolution. Light Law says, I forgot today is supposed to be Wednesday. <laughs> we are here. <laughs> and actually today was kind of this weird, like, I woke up too in that weird days. I don't know if it's because the movie was so late. And then we got home late. I've, yeah, I was kind of thrown off this morning. I thought it was, honestly, I woke up thinking it was Thursday. Maybe it's because we did video all the yesterday, though, with um, the video. I mean, stuff. yeah, yesterday was exhausting doing the filming all day. And then I think uh, I had a call with the beer company that I draw the birds for. That took a while. And I'm going to be doing one more that uh, the due date is literally Monday morning. So I know, now know, okay, I literally have four days or four nights, really. Uh so yeah, I think I'm I'm feeling a little overwhelmed, uh, but in like a not bad way, but in a okay, I need to like get my things together, but I also need to make sure I'm not over pushing myself. Yes. Uh, but I do want to keep the schedule that we set, the one that we recorded yesterday. I really want to stay true to making sure every Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, I'm st I'm set with this schedule, and all three of my big projects are being worked on every single workday, uh, so that that stays consistent. And I don't want curveballs like even tonight. I don't know if I told you, my mom called. I have to go help watch the kids at my brother's new house for an hour and a half, and it's just another one of those things where, okay, so then as soon as I'm done with this, we'll probably eat. I'll probably just chill for an hour or two and then I gotta go help out my brother and his kids and then I might come back and then maybe I'll start working on the freelance project. You know, it's like budgeting your time essentially. And the older I get, the more I'm realizing it can be very difficult, especially if you want a structured life within a job format that is so unstructured. We have the most unstructured work life and I think setting those boundaries and like sticking to them is very important. So I told my mom, I do not want to be called upon to do stuff if it's before five. But obviously, I'll be there for family, uh, you know, if you ever need me. But I need there to be some respect for my boundaries of I'm pretty serious of even though I know I'm at home and I'm just drawing on paper. <laughs> like uh, I need people to take it more seriously that are in our lives so that it's not interrupted constantly. Yeah. Well, I think it's more giving you more heads up, too. I think it's the issue, too. Sometimes you get, like, oh, last, last second. Yeah. yeah. Um, and that's, I think, yeah, just putting up those boundaries with that. 
Oscar says, I love how easy you make it look and seems especially simple working digitally. Like underdrawings and such become so much easier when working with layers. Makes me wish I had a drawing pad. Oh, I highly recommend it. If you can uh, afford it, if, if you're able to save up for it even, um, I think the iPad has been an absolutely marvelous tool for uh, artists nowadays, especially artists on the go. I, I honestly think every one of our friends that does digital at all, they have an iPad, mm -hmm. you know? It's well, not even a question. IPads, what do they have? Computers. I, I was, was literally there lugged. Any tablets before it, though? Like portable tablets? Mm, no, not. Well, some people drew on their I, Android phones. I remember I actually had an Android phone at one point that had the pen. Oh. It was small. I mean, I could draw on it, yeah, but nothing to the level that Procreate is. Uh, but no, before this, I would lug my laptop with my bamboo Wacom tablet everywhere I went. Oh, God. So whenever I set up, I'd need a desk that can fit both. Now, I would draw like this with my one hand kind of in front oh. on the keyboard and my other hand up in front of me. That, that was kind of sick. Mm-hmm. Oh, the glory days. <laughs> Tidjal says, we don't talk about Bruno, no. We don't talk about Bruno, <laughs> Such a good no, song. No, I often no, have it no. in my head as well. I like how there's not a classic villain. It's about self-sabotage and family issues. I like it. Oh, see, I didn't even know that. Because like I said, I avoid watching trailers now, so I have no idea. Well, what's funny is I used to be the person that watched every single trailer that ever came out ever. <laughs> every week, I would just find, or basically every day, I follow so many movie channels on YouTube that I would just watch every new movie trailer. And then it, I think it got to a point where, what movie did I feel like was? Oh, kind of mother exclamation point i yeah, love that how, one definitely but i love how misleading it was but I, I can understand why people were upset with that trailer but i think i was thinking to myself of i gotta stop going into movies with expectations of what i think it's gonna be and oh i know the one that totally totally changed my opinion was minari oh because dni because apparently the trailer they have a burning house in the trailer and the whole movie goes by and no burning house. And then at the very end, it happens. And it kind of, I remember you and D being like, it kind of ruined the experience a little bit because you're waiting for that shot that you, know you saw in the happen. trailer. Yeah. And the worst part is there's no other house that has been introduced the whole movie. So you know it's going to be the house that they live in. And like, you, you, it's hard for you to even care about what they're doing or like improvements around the house because you know from watching the trailer that it's just going to burn up in flames anyways. So that would be my my advice 2020 outside of the art world is to just don't watch trailers for movies <laughs> that you think that you'll enjoy. So like when Darren Aronofsky's new trailer comes out for his next film, you can definitely be sure I'm not watching it. Or the Norseman, or what's it called, Norseman? The new uh, Dave Eggers. The one with or Robert Eggers. Yeah. Taylor in it? Oh, gosh. It was, yeah, I think it's the Northman. Northman. Yeah, I think that's it. Yes, nor just North. The Northman, yeah. The Northman. The Northman, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, that'd be my advice. Yeah, I'm not watching any trailers. So well, even uh, we went to go see French Dispatch in December, and it's the new Wes Anderson film, and I love Wes Anderson, so I know I'm gonna enjoy it. Uh, and I didn't see the trailer, and it it was like a three year thing where I had to avoid watching a trailer for like two to three years because of COVID. And when we finally saw the movie, I was like, oh, I loved it. Like, one of the best movies I saw last year. And then we went home and I finally watched the trailer. It would have given away so much. And I think a lot of the visuals, I would have been waiting for it to happen. Where, for example, there's a st um, uh, animated part in the movie that doesn't happen till like, the third act. But it's in the trailer. So the whole time I'd be watching this movie, I would be expecting it. Where instead, when it turned from live action to the animation it was like this nice surprise and it was like this treat to visually change the aesthetic at kind of a crucial part and i i really enjoyed the shift in the surprise element that it brought with it where that if we were seeing the trailer i would have i would have known that that would have been somewhere yeah What else we got? Um, that's what I'm catching up on. 
Uh, Tafalina says, I relate it with Encanto simply because I'm Latina and I find that it very clearly showed how our parents and grandparents always demand perfection. Yeah, I definitely think we're going to watch that one because that'll be... Is it on Disney Plus yet or no? I think so. Not yet? Okay. I mean, I know Disney and Pixar is a little bit more of a harder sell for me nowadays. I think I've been burned by, especially the Disney remakes. I refuse to see another Disney re remake. Uh, and I think uh, Luca kind of set the tone for Pixar specifically of this felt like a cash grab. And yeah, I don't know. We'll see. Well, wait, what was the last Disney animated movie we saw? I think it was. It Luca. wasn't Raya, because we didn't see Raya in The Last Dragon. I heard mixed things about that one, too. I think it was Luca. No, Luca's Pixar. What was, like, the last Disney, oh, Disney animated one? film? Mm, was it, it was in Dumbo. No, that's live action. Uh, I I'll have to walking. think about it. <laughs> um, but I did like the song. I do like the Bruno song. Yeah. I think the visuals in it look really cool too. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the when I'm scrolling up it'll like push it down. Here we go. Alright, Felix says I saw Don't Look Up and it was straight up garbage. The film doesn't oh. look, <laughs> and film doesn't become good just because some lines are improvised by famous actors. Okay, low key, I actually liked Don't Look Up. Um, but I'm always good for like healthy discussion about movies because I'm sure there's a lot of you that liked movies I cannot stand. And I think it's totally valid then if I really like movies that you guys just hate. Don't look up. I don't, I definitely felt like they were pushing the political agenda near the middle, especially the Meryl Streep section where she's campaigning for like the re-election. That felt a little like, um, what's it called when it's like hard pressed, leaning like one way. Tropey. No. Mm. It just, it, it definitely felt forced where I like that for a lot of the movie, they were playing the middle ground of making fun of, especially in America, both right and left. I felt like they were doing a good job at poking fun at both sides, which I think we need more of. I think there's so much slated one way or the other that it was kind of nice watching one that felt like it was able to poke fun at both, except for that one part. <laughs> uh, and to be honest, I kind of liked the dark humor. I'm a dark humor fan. Uh, it, it was a, a little long and I don't know... There were some parts that were cringy for me, specifically Jonah Hill. I don't think his inclusion was great. All, all the other characters felt funny and kind of a satire of what they were doing. Um, maybe not so much uh, Leo and Jennifer Lawrence, but I definitely felt that Jonah Hill was like a caricature of a person. And he he, he always took me out of it. But yeah, personally, I actually, I liked Don't Look Up. I didn't say it was great. I think it was like a 7 out of 10 for me type movie. It was like an easy watch. Oscar Huben says, too, I saw it recently. It was very mediocre and all the characters were almost too cartoony in traits and people yeah. they were supposed to represent. I My favorite part, though, is when they're kind of making fun of a, um, Steve Jobs, like a TED Talk. And mind you, I love Apple. I All my products are Apple, but they they kind of poked fun at how oversensitive everyone is nowadays. And you have like the leader of the like too sensitive trope. Oh gosh, yeah. And he like brings out children onto the stage and the, the kid at one point, they're like explaining what this new, I forgot what it was. Oh, it would like sense when you're being triggered your, or whatever. Your emotions and send you a happy video or something. Yeah. It would yeah. send you a happy video if you're, you're being <laughs> triggered negatively. And the little girl, then one of the present, <laughs> or she's one of the presenters. Oh my says, god, that's right. Uh, hey, I forgot what his name is, but like, hey, Steve, may I ask a question? And then <laughs> immediately he's like, uh, no. And then like keeps going Just with the presentation. No. Cold, and then he keeps going. I, I think because I love the level of, uh, it's not a mockumentary. I mean, I love mockumentaries. If you guys have ever seen like Best in Show, the ones about like dog show trainers, or. Uh, Actually, no, I think that is my favorite one. Uh, I love that level of humor where it, it knows what it is. It doesn't take itself too seriously, but all the characters treat things very seriously. And I think that's where the funny parts come in. So to me, that was the best parts of Don't Look Up. But I totally understand if you didn't like it uh, because it is. There are parts that felt silly, like very silly. <laughs> I think just see a movie. Oh, this must. 
Yeah, I feel like I'm a little behind right now. Jen says, a movie that completely wrecks the subject because they do new research, who to thunk? I'm guessing that was in response about the tarot. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. I need to do some catching up here. Oh, apparently it's on Disney+. Plus. Oh, is it really? Yeah. Okay, so we'll have to watch that. I would watch it. I mean, just for the Bruno song. <laughs> <laughs> you know what's kind of cool? Okay, I'll give whoever, some of the artists at Disney, I'll definitely give some credit to because as I was I was watching this, we don't talk about Bruno's song on YouTube. And I was, of course, scrolling through the comments. And there was a lot of people mentioning about how you can see Bruno lurking in the background. And to be honest, I watched the video like twice or like I listened to it, but I was also kind of watching. I didn't notice the first two times. So the third time I was like actively looking for him. And yeah, if you look closely, he's like in the background and in some areas, he's like center in the background. And like if if you actually notice to look, you'll see him. Uh, but it was like a cool little Easter egg. And I'm like, OK, all right, oh. Disney. I don't know who what artists were in charge of that, but kudos to you. I, I like those little fun things that they're not like in your face, like, oh, you should notice this. But if you care to observe and like take in the the visual more, you'll notice it. I love that. Uh, Felix says, I don't think the political thing was the problem. I actually thought Meryl Streep reminded me more of Hillary rather than Trump. The problem for me oh. was that it was really inconsistent in tone. Um, at times it felt as if you were supposed to feel sincerely, but then most of the characters are just cartoons. Yeah, it was very satirical, I almost feel like, most of the movie. So it's hard to tell like if you're supposed to be feeling serious or if you're... I don't know, as a viewer, you're almost confused in what your emotions should be. But I mean, I it's very fair. It did I, good at what it did. I, I can know. see why people would be upset with it, but I, I liked the tone of it being like, this is a very serious subject matter, but in today's day and age, a lot of people are just very dismissive. And they if there's anything negative, they'll like look the other way, or we can't focus on that unless it'll get us views or money in some way. I mean, it's a very gross way of looking at humanity, but I do think it reflects... Uh, a very strange light on ourselves as like a society. Uh, but I do understand, like if the tone wasn't for you, I totally get it. I think that's one of those films that are very uh, divisive. I think it can either go, you're going to enjoy it for the tone or you're going to like just absolutely hate it for the tone. But on that note, I must say, I would definitely prefer watching a movie that has a polarizing reaction of like hate and love than a film that's very like middle of the ground and forgettable in two days. I think there's a lot of films that we, because I take Josh, or yeah, I would say I get you to watch a lot of movies nowadays. Yeah. And I hate watching a movie that feels like it was just made to be made to like keep money flowing into the studio. Uh, and I'm sure a lot of you guys might feel that way about like, especially bigger studios. You can definitely tell, especially with Disney and Pixar or. Oh, I hate to even say their name in this conversation, but even Ghibli with the new the Earwig and the Witch movie, that felt very filler and okay, very yeah. much like we just need the people that have jobs here to like make another movie. Yeah, that was a little that, that was, was rough. that was bad. That was definitely um, one of the worst movies I saw last year. I would say. I don't know. I think for me, it's just been stories lately. I mean, even TV shows lately. I just feel storylines don't have. They're not bringing anything new or different or they're not bringing in a discussion that we haven't had about things before, giving us maybe a different view of something before. I feel like everything's just very, we know what people like and we're going to play it so safe with the story. Nothing feels like it's really making us think outside the box anymore when it comes to how stories are written. Because even Nightmare Alley, it was just like, okay, cool, this is a lesson I know, or this is something I've thought about before already too, like. Well, not, basically what you're putting out there is gonna come back right back at you like we've seen that i don't know i mean it's weird that i feel like i'm defending nightmare alley when yesterday you were like defending it hard and i was being harsh on it well maybe i needed the night to I sleep think, on it <laughs> i think the theme of nightmare alley i actually liked i like that we were following a protagonist that ended up being well i don't want to actually spoil yeah, no it. spoilers we'll we'll just say that you find out more about him where uh, he's not what you originally okay, that's thought good, that's good that's good that's good that's not spoiling i was scared you're gonna go <laughs> <laughs> But I think that is a story that we 
haven't seen a lot. I think the execution, though, could have been so much better with, like, little tweaks, like, along the way. If they would have, like, added a line or taken scenes out throughout the movie, it would have just been a much better movie, in my opinion. Uh, I mean... But, you know... I think stories, though, have been... You can say a lot of... What was the one that we watched? The one series... Oh my god. There's been a lot. The Nicole Kidman one, for example, I thought. Oh, Nine Perfect Strangers. Nine Perfect Strangers was one where it's like the story set off so good, and then the story, they just dropped it. Um, Or that one Halloween one, the one we watched that we thought we'd really love. And then. Oh, Channel Zero. Channel season Zero, two. Season Two. The No. What was it? The No End House? Yeah. Writing just got. Although. Really whack at the end there. It was even though so the rest of the season was absolute garbage the first episode of season two of channel zero possibly my favorite horror thing or i don't even know if i want to call it horror well kind of yeah. like a suspense best i've probably seen in my life it's like honestly logical. if they would have made just a movie about that first episode that would be my favorite i think like psychological horror movie ever like up there with the shining for me and without the gratuitous like gore or anything like it did such an excellent job of being like tense and unsettling without it being like close up shots of like someone getting their eyeball slit with a razor or something that is just unnecessarily gratuitous. And I loved it, but I, I don't know what happened to the rest of the season because after like season or episode four, you're like, is this even the same team? Like what's, what's happening here? It, it was, that was so disappointing for me or even the American horror story, red tide, the new season first episode actually kind of intriguing i want to know where this goes and by the end of it you're like oh my god that was a waste yeah. of my time <laughs> i was actually kind of digging it for a second and then it was so sudden, good yeah well i wouldn't say so good it it was much better than what i was expecting the story was intriguing that you want to you want to know what happened and then there's that one that one episode it just completely changed everything and you're like oh never mind um which you... let's be honest american horror story does have the bad habit of like setting up a lot of interesting things but it has so much going for it and things are moving so fast that it gets kind of sloppy in the second half. Well, Some of the things yeah. they stick and then a lot of the other things are like, what? Like, why would they pick that direction? But you know why I think we keep watching American Horror Story? is because it does have this element of you don't really know what direction it's going to go in. We were there for the train wreck, I guess. Kind of. Okay. Kind of. Um, I missed a couple too, so I'm going to go back to these ones. EJ, doo -doo -doo. where was the one? I just had yours there. So I'm just this thing, like all those scrolls, so I can't even like keep something locked where I want it to be. Gotta be quick, my dude. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> okay. I recently want to whack them. <laughs> whack them. Whack them. <laughs> like whack them all. Whack them. Wait, I'm thinking like waka right now from waka. Or something. Oh. a waka tablet. <laughs> and as a traditional artist, I'm excited. Well, congratulations on winning that, too. That's pretty cool. I'm Congrats excited parents. and scared about it at the same time. What is the best program to use for a novice like me? For a tablet? Yeah. I mean, I would prefer Procreate. I know a lot of people have been talking about Clip Studio recently. Uh, personally, though, I love Procreate. I think it gives me everything I would want in, like, a digital... Can you use that with a tablet? The Clip Studio? No, the Waka tablets. Oh, I'm yeah. sorry. I'm thinking... Whack what em. am I thinking? Whack them. Whack them. Okay. Uh, Photoshop. If I'm going to be honest here, I mean, especially if you want to work in the industry, I would get most familiar with Photoshop because I would say like 80% of the industry now works with Photoshop. So it would be better to know that program. And then if you go to a company that works with like some other uh, software, I would think that they, they would help you adjust to the new one. But I think having the understanding of Photoshop would be most important. And like, yeah, Photoshop can be a little expensive, but on the bright side, uh, you can do like free trials for sure. And there's a lot of people, I'm not going to condone it, uh, that just pirate it. I'm not going to say that it's possible, but it is. Uh, and I would say a lot of my schoolmates, especially in college, definitely, you know, showed me the ropes of how to be a pirate. You but, need to watch Nightmare Alley again. <laughs> Clearly didn't learn your lesson. Uh, but obviously I'm not going to promote that, but I'm also not going to condone it because I understand when, you know, financials are t tight. 
Oh my god. Hmm. The votes at 50-50 again. 48 votes. That means 24 people. <laughs> 24 people said C3, 24 said fireplace. I'm telling you. We'll have to wait till the end of the stream now. How is that possible? <laughs> uh, Oscar says, I've seen these laptop drawing pad hybrids. They're probably super expensive, but maybe maybe worth it since you get two in one. I already have a laptop, but it's garbage. I use it only for schooling, for school art. I know uh, Sean had the Surface Pro, and at first he liked it, but then it kind of grew on or grew away from him. Honestly, the more he used it, uh, I've had some people though that love it. So a lot of it does come down to personal preference. I think if there is a store near you that you could go to and actually test some of them out, because uh, it it is like touch and go with a lot of them. So me personally, I really like working on a Cintiq or my uh, iPad, or uh, when I first started out, I only worked on tablets that were connected to a computer. Uh, so it's hard for me to even like recommend one or say one's better than the other, because a lot of it does come down to personal preference. But I would say the iPad has been consistently well received by basically all my art friends that have tried it. And I would say most of them, especially the digital artist friends that I have, use Procreate on a daily basis. So on the iPad. All right. Let's see. Uh, Carlos says, I recommend you guys the movie I Dream in Another Language. It's one of the best Mexican movies of the last years. Ooh, okay. Can you write that one down? Yeah. Yeah, if you have any good movie recommendations that are more outside of the typical spectrum of what people would want to watch, I definitely watch a lot of weird ones, probably weirder than Josh would ever want me to watch. I think there's sometimes <laughs> I'll be watching like a foreign film in the front room and it turns out to be like borderline smut and we don't have curtains in the front room so people just walking by would watch me watching like this french i was gonna say i know there's the whole stereotype that french movies are the ones that are a little risque with some stuff watch a lot of french ones that are risque some of those are like we have a big tv in our front room (laughs) that faces the road and i feel like some of our neighbors think we're just literally watching porn on the big screen like it's some of these french films i'm like oh my god some of them i'm like oh but, this is getting a little or what's the one i just watched? oh belladonna of sadness some of you may have seen art from it online or on instagram i thought i was gonna love it because it has this watercolor feel and it's hand drawn and hand painted but honestly i thought that was very smutty like if people were watching me watch this in the front room, like passing by, like walking their dog, there were a lot of parts that were cringy to watch because it's very focused on like taking advantage of women and the devil having urges sexually all the time and then her having sexual urges all the time. I don't remember you were watching that one. I, I watched this by yeah, you were upstairs. I well visually I think it's great. I love how unique the art style is, but it's hard for me to recommend it without being like, but it's also super pervy. You <laughs> I know. I know some people love it and will like swear by it. I am I'm I don't think I'm one of those people. I think I would say it's I'm glad I watched it for the aesthetics. I don't think it's something that I would recommend. Um but I'll also see any type of movie. Um, I'll watch any movie at least once, uh, regardless of subject matter. And there have been some times where I thought a movie would be really bad, and then it ended up being great, and it was a movie that I wouldn't normally see myself watching. I feel like we did see a movie by this director of the one that Carlos recommended. Are these his movies? Yeah. Uh, it wasn't that, though. No, I have not. No? Mm-mm. Okay. I like the cover art for these eyelids. Yeah, the cover. Actually, there's a couple cool covers. I like the far left one. Yeah. All right, cool. Got that one done. Oh, Astrid. Astrid. Wait, that sounds like Casper in the ceiling. <laughs> oh, my goodness. 
All right, let me see where I'm at here. Sorry, I keep going like way off screen. <laughs> you, you this read wrong says, ah, oh, yes, finally someone as picky with movies as me. Our battles will be legendary. <laughs> Tim is very. <laughs> Let's start. Okay, what are your picky. what are your top three favorite movies? And I think just to give context, my I would say, you know what, I'm going to give top five, and then I'll, I'll let you give your top five as well. <laughs> uh, my top five, I would definitely say Signacti, New York, The Fall by Tarsum, uh, Spirited Away. I'm going to throw Moulin Rouge in there as well. And then, oh, final pick. I feel like my final slot is constantly being swapped in and out with movies. I really liked Mother! Exclamation Point. I would say that was a 10 out of 10 for me experience. But then there's other movies like Eternal Sunshine that I think is excellent. Ooh. And I also thought Moonrise Kingdom was excellent. So yeah, I guess those would be my roughly top five movies. What about you, Josh? Um... Okay. <laughs> Moulin Rouge is my first. I like that movie so much. Dang. Yep, I'm happy you showed me that one. Um, my second would be Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. <laughs> my third movie. These are going to be so different than yours. <laughs> my third favorite is going to be Lord of the Rings, The Fellowship of the Ring. <laughs> um, my fourth will be... Oh, I don't actually think that far out. Um, oh, you like the Cheetah movie? Oh, Duma. Duma. Yeah, I do like Duma. Yeah, I'll probably put Duma up there too. Uh, and then my fifth favorite movie is Halloween, probably. Oh, like the that original first one. Yeah, still my top. Oh my gosh, there's. I, I legit almost made like my favorite movies of 2021 video, but I've never recorded a video like that. And then I didn't know. I mean, I still might, but I would love to also do some movie review content because I love like literally my second passion outside of art is film. And I, I love having discussions with people about like what films they like, what they don't. We have really good debates with one of our friends, Kyle, because he won't let me get away with if I don't like a movie, he'll challenge me on it. And I love that because I feel like I have actual reasons and like ammunition for why I thought a movie performed poorly. And those type of discussions I like live for, <laughs> you know, you do like your movie I love discussions. movie discussions. Kind of like that one guy you met at uh, C2E2 and you just, you talked with him for like hours about movies because he had so many weird recommendations of movies i've never heard before which is rare i feel like it's rare for me to meet someone that would recommend movies i've never heard of before after want to come join us on the stream for a little bit yeah yeah that's come on you stream <laughs> hi baby girl come here hi. Astrid, come here come on <laughs> come on astrid please <laughs> oh no 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 chewing no chewing cables Hi, baby. Come here. You guys ready to meet Astrid again? Astrid has a little surprise on today. <laughs> Hi, Astrid. Hi, baby girl. Hi. Oh, sweetie Hi. dear. Hi. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> okay. Oh, there she goes. I think you guys might get a close-up shot. Possibly. It's gonna be like just below her. Hi. Hi. Astrid currently has a little cone on. I'll probably take it off today, though, Astrid. Yay. <laughs> Actually, it's even, I think it's still good even when we, we even us, disagree on movies. Astrid. I think the one big one that we, like, I think there was like visceral reaction in terms of talking about it even is Climax, the French movie from no. Gaspar Noir. Um, let's find the next comment. <laughs> I hate that movie. If you guys want to watch a really weird horror movie that 
doesn't deal with like horror in like the slasher sense, but horror in this is actually like a terrifying situation to find yourself in. Uh, climax. <laughs> There's Astrid. Oh. <laughs> Oh god, though. I what? hate that movie. I literally think that's my favorite Tim, horror movie. For some reason, loves that movie. It's one of those movies that it's so unsettling. I get yeah, I hate that feeling though. And then Tim watches the trailer sometimes randomly too. Yeah, I love the trailer. I don't know why you watch the trailer, but Ugh, that's the one movie I just I never I think want to watch. The it reason ever I like again. it so much, and I think horror has always intrigued me as a genre, because like 80% of it is hot garbage. But then the 20% is actually pretty great. But then there's like 1% that captures horror in such an unsettling way that you feel, even after you are watching it and like leaving it, you're left so devastated um, from it. And that's what that movie does to people. Everyone that I showed it to, they watch it feeling like drained. And I love that. I hate that movie. <laughs> what's up okay no but it's also Three, not a very two. general admission friendly movie it's very weird format doesn't really get going until halfway through but once it gets going it is a roller coaster from hell and i love it <laughs> <laughs> janisha says cat that's little astrid she's a cutie she has an issue though where she sleeps in front of the heat vents and i think it's just drying her skin out so then she gets all itchy so she has a little spot right now i had to put the cone on because she was making it bleed um all right let me jump up again though um, felix says i don't need movies to reinvent the wheel but i don't like when it appeals to the lowest common denominator for financial gain I mean, I mean, I think that's why I thought Don't Look Up. Well, maybe you're not talking about that one. Maybe you're talking about like uh, Disney movies. Oh, God. what is she doing? She's up in the window now. Oh, hi, Astrid. <laughs> I agree. You can definitely tell when a movie is just cashing in. Oh, God. The box does not feel like it's going to hold her. Literally, the only time Astrid comes in this room and like is weirdly exploratory is when we're doing streams so sometimes when we're doing this we have to like just make sure she doesn't hurt herself i feel like she's okay um I'm trying to decide if i want her to have jewelry on or not i don't know oh i didn't realize you had the flip on this whole time oh uh, yeah i have to oh I don't know if I want it. Do you do you guys think I should have jewelry? I don't know. We can close off the current bowl and open up a new one. <laughs> I would love to know, actually, everyone's favorite movies. Maybe not five. Five's a lot for a lot of people. Maybe like three. If you can think of it's like three favorite movies and that you want us to give our opinions on, I would love to have a movie discourse. Because like I said, I was feeling really disoriented this morning, but like <laughs> talking about movies, I'm like, <gasps> like I perk up. I'm like, yes. <laughs> I might go get a water in a second, so I'm going to leave you with a movie question. Because once <laughs> I do that, Tim will be fine then. <laughs> um, do you need a water or something to um up there? You've got Mio in it. No, Mio. Okay. All right, what's the question? Um, let's see. Do, 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 do. I feel like you can go to town after I read this one. Nicole says, I'm getting tired of mindless violence or shock just for the sake of shock in movies or shows. It just feels like a lot of entertainment is trying too hard to be edgy and it gets out of hand. Yeah, I agree. I think, yeah, there's so much that I could unpack with this too. Uh, yeah, I'm not a super big fan of shock value. And I think collectively, I think we're seeing a change in how we're viewing... Okay. Uh, even like video games, I think I've been reading a lot of stuff on like when you play Uncharted, Nathan Drake is technically the good guy that you're cheering for. But what we come to miss is the fact that he slaughters like hundreds, if not over a thousand people along his journey. 
and every game. So, like, he's murdered thousands of people. Uh, and we just kind of turn a blind eye to it because we're supposed to be supporting him. But, like, some of these people that we're killing, they might have, like, they have no stories. They're just, like, uh, empty vessels that we're supposed to believe uh, we're justifying killing. So... I, I'm starting to see the turn a little bit, not not fully, because then you have games that are even more, even like more gratuitous. And uh, I think the one that, and this is a hot take, hot take incoming. Um, I thought Last of Us Two pushed it too far. Where I I didn't really enjoy Last of Us Two, uh, not for the reasons that a lot of people online, but I thought the violence was actually so much that I couldn't play more than half. So I got halfway through and I had to watch the final half because. There were times where you like you shoot someone's arm off and they're like screaming bloody murder for help on the ground and I it just felt like too real in the sense that I don't know why I felt gross playing it. It got to the point where I felt gross playing it. And especially killing the animals and uh the way that a lot of the the killings happen like I think stabbing the pregnant woman in the neck multiple times was I I was I was so turned off from the violence in that game uh, that we'll see what happens in the future. I, I don't know what's going to be the future of gaming and with like violence and shock value. I think with you're always going to get a spectrum with everything, and I think entertainment's not immune to that. So you're always going to have pockets on every level of, uh, like especially talking about like violence, you're going to have like the very pacifist movies and the hyper gratuitous violence and there's always gonna be a range and there's always gonna be that bell curve where most of them fall in the middle but i don't think you can ever get away with them completely so that is an interesting point of view uh, that i think a lot of us are sharing collectively and that's how i kind of felt even with okay another hot take incoming uh breath of the wild i felt like we were just constantly killing uh things and a lot of the times i felt like these like go goblins or whatever the trolls were were just minding their own business around a campfire and then here comes link like a mass murderer psycho like spinning his sword and just chopping their heads off and i'm like what am i doing <laughs> it, it's been very hard for me to play a game where the point or like the objective is just to be a mass murderer essentially uh and i think there's some games that do a good job of like justifying it in a way that feels valid like, I've been replaying Final Fantasy X, and I'm biased because that is my favorite game of all time, but the way that they do the monsters and the, the fiends, as they call them in the game, is they're all souls of the unrest that are bitter of the living, so they slowly become these creatures that prey upon people that are still alive. So when you kill them, you release their souls back into the ether, and you can kind of, uh, like, send them to the next, the afterlife, essentially. So in a weird way, you're actually doing them a favor by killing this monstrous uh, version of who they've become. Um, and I thought that was just a really good way of showing an RPG and like constantly, you know, taking down enemies without it feeling like you're slaughtering innocent creatures. What was the other one that I really liked? Um, I played the remake of the game, the um, Shadow, oh, of the Shadow of the Classes. Classes. Because I thought you realized there was a, at the end, there was a repercussion for what you did, though. You were trying to do it, you, in the character's head, he was trying to do a good thing, but. You're shaking the table a little too much. Oh, God, sorry. <laughs> but in the. I know I you want to like. hands for everything. <laughs> um, yeah, in the end, you were like, oh, we actually messed up. I like when there's at least, if you're going to be, if your character's going to be killing someone, I like that there's a repercussion for it then. Instead of just letting you get away with it. Yeah. I mean, the remake for that game was absolutely gorgeous. Absolutely. I feel like there's got to be a lot of questions that we've missed. Let's do like a quick catch up. Okay. Catch up time. Do, 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 do. Um, Janisha says, story matters and characters that are relatable too. Yeah, that's where I liked Nine Perfect Strangers, for example, is one where the characters felt like real people. I, Even for me, it's like I don't have to personally relate, but as long as I can see this being a fully fleshed out person that I could see being real. So that's why the show I liked, but the end then, they kind of just made the characters become, I don't know, character creatures or whatever again. Characters. It was just, yeah, it was just really weird. Well, um, and here's another hot take too. I... 
I hate that people nowadays feel that if you want to be represented on the screen, they have to look like you. Or in in like our case, I hate queer characters now in recent, specifically Netflix shows. They're so tropey and so opposite of who I feel I relate to when I watch movies and film and games. Uh, and I hate the fact that people kind of now put me in the same box of, well, hey, Tim, you're like this character because he's gay too. I'm like, being gay is like 5, 10% of my personality. The 90% of myself usually relates to like the strong domineering women archetype in films or a lot of the times the more like bro good guy characters like and usually they're both straight archetypes and I'm totally okay with that I I find it very comfortable to relate to like a strong powerful woman or like a bro regardless of race or gender uh and I, I don't like that now we're forcing this idea that for you to relate to character they have to not only look exactly like you but then they have to be uh their, their sexual orientation also oh, matters. Yeah. I think if not a fan I think of that. Growing up is learning that you can relate to a people. lot of different people. Yeah, it's Just like people. I, I relate to people. I don't need to know. And know. it's weird, especially in the movement of of uh, being more. Well, and I'm not trying to be anti this either because I think uh, showing diversity is important. I really do think that's important, and seeing yourself represented. Uh, especially for people of color, I think it is something that is important and we want to see more of for sure. I think the the thing that I have an issue with is, and we were talking to our friend Kyle, who is black. He has a problem with this too, where like people then always say they, rem- like a character reminds them of Kyle, but it's really just because that character is black. And that's not fair to Kyle, because when I think of Kyle, he is such a, he, there's so many facets to his personality that are far more interesting than his skin color. And the fact that people just put him in the box of like, oh, I saw this character. And then Kyle's like, is it because they're black? Yeah. (laughs) Where like when I think of characters that I think of that when I like relate them to Kyle, it's usually women coming to terms with like their femininity and like coming of age stories because Kyle's very sensitive. He's very insightful. And those are the type of archetypes. And even if they're like white girls, you know, I think Kyle would agree that that's sometimes the archetype he can relate to. Uh, and I think that's something that I don't, I don't know. It's a it's definitely an interesting conversation. Definitely love seeing the diversity and representation. But I think we also have to be aware of that doesn't mean that they're going to immediately relate to the character just because they look like them mm-hmm. or just because a character is gay doesn't mean I'm going to be like, yes, love, like, yes, yes queen, yeah. honey. <laughs> like, that's not going to be uh, my reaction. Like, even watching Nightmare Alley, I loved Kate Blanchett. I me that was a character i related to most because she loved the power play dynamics and like mental gymnastics uh and i, I love that out of all the characters and there's a you know straight white woman but that's I who mean, i related to most Kate blanchett is kind of amazing though so she is amazing best part of the film in my opinion for sure all right i gotta do some catching up though all right catch up tim says catch up and then he does catch up catch up catch up 10 minute monologues and every single thing all right, catch up. Um, Felix says, I feel the same with certain anime. I can look past some fan service, but I won't recommend it to other people, or they would think I like the anime specifically because of it rather than in spite of it. Yes. Um, EJ says, I highly recommend the wonderfully weird Japanese horror movie. Oh, I think we, you told me about, I don't think I've seen this one, Haosu. Oh, yes. From 1977. Very interesting when you know it should have been Japan's answer to Jaws. I don't think you should have it yet, That was though. supposed to be Japan's answers in Jaws. Uh, Haosu is amazing. Or, it's so mm. weird. It's Actually, speaking of Haosu, the director, if you're not aware, he made his Swan Song, Swan Song movie, I think, two years ago. I didn't even know about this, but it's his final film. And for those of you who don't know uh, anything of what we're talking about, Haosu is like a super weird movie. I think it's the 70s, maybe 80s. I think it's 70s, though. Uh and it's definitely one I would recommend. It's so kooky and it partly campy, uh, but it's definitely one of those unique films that I think every person that loves film, especially if like they like arty films, should watch. And the director, admittedly, I haven't seen his other projects before, but I just heard about this recent one, and I'm definitely going to give that one a try because Housey was so weird and unique that I'm sure this movie will have kind of the same flavor. So anyways, catch up. 
All right, Light says, did you say the fall? It's my all-time favorite. <gasps> the Tarsum fall? Oh, my God. I forgot about that. Yeah, falls in my top five, I think, too. Love. I love that movie. Actually, that was one that I appreciate you showed me. Suspir mm -hmm. or not Suspiria. Climax. I wish you never showed me. <laughs> <laughs> Out of context, that sounds so bad. Yeah. Uh, hold on. Oh, God. If you open up YouTube, and then... Because I want you to share a link. So if you guys have seen The Fall by Tarsum, uh, literally... I, every time I watch it, I'm like, I think this is my favorite movie. But then I'll watch the next New Yorker. I'm like, I'm pretty sure this is my favorite movie. Oh, so are like, you talking about that one thing that explains it? or So there is um, a reaction video to The Fall. Oh, gosh. What's happening? I, I'll go check. And it's from, like, Stories of Old. No, type The Fall, like Stories of Old. So like Stories of Old is one of my favorite movie reviewers. He gives very insightful talks, and his voice is like butter. I thought it was an old man talking. Oh, this one, right? Yes. Okay, pause it, though. Okay. And then share that link. So if you guys have seen The Fall, I don't watch this if you haven't seen it yet. Uh, this is such a beautiful interpretation of The Fall, and it's called How Stories Can Save Us. It is. It actually makes me tear up a little bit. Uh, he does such a good job uh, giving his interpretation of what the movie is supposed to convey. And if you guys enjoy The Fall, I'm sure you'll like this uh, video as well. And it's only like 10 minutes, so I, I recommend it highly. I'll read something and then I'll go check on what's going on over there. All right. <laughs> These cats sometimes. Um, Oscar says, uh, off the top of my head, straight out good or memorable movies, Seven Passengers, Total Recall, Scott Pilgrim for the, vs. the World, <laughs> Tarzan, not the live action, The Truman Show, and Rat Race. We you were just talking about show Truman, Truman show. show. That's right. I'm telling you, back. we keep hearing it. Um, it was literally in one of the uh, like advertisements yesterday before the movie started, and it was great uh, because I've been telling Josh he needs to watch The Truman Show, and like the past three weeks, I we keep hearing about it, or it keeps coming up. It's one of those things where the more you talk about it, the more you become aware of it when you hear it, and uh, he hasn't seen it before. I think Truman Show is great. I think it's one of those movies that... Uh, it's just very unique in its story. And I think everyone should watch it if they love movies. Because uh, I think it does give a interesting discussion that can happen afterwards. Of like, is this moral, that what was happening throughout the Truman Show? And uh, sometimes I think a lot of us feel like we're going through something that similar to what Truman is going through. Uh, and I know there's even a syndrome now that was diagnosed after the movie. It's it's named after the movie where it's like the, the Truman um, oh phenomena. Or there's, there's a name for it, but it's when people believe that they're being videotaped all the time for a television show. And it, it's, yeah, it's great. I like Truman Show a lot. I like the music too. Oh, hi. All right. I don't know. I don't know what happened. Some things were thrown around, so I think it might have been Casper movie jumping down. No, that's fine. And then he like shot stuff all around by accident. Um... I hope Astrid feels better. She'll be good. She does this like once every couple months where she'll get a little spot, scratch it, and I have to put the cone on for like three days, four days. Hopefully she'll, this one will heal up. Um, you This Red Wrong says, I don't think I have a top five, but some good movies that I really respect are Ratatouille, <laughs> <laughs> Joker, Spirited Away, Princess Minoki. Mononoke. Mononoke, sorry. Minoki. <laughs> Tim, <laughs> The Devil Wears Prada, etc. I've not watched Devil Wears Prada in so long. Actually, say it. I would. I would like to rewatch it. I remember thinking it was kind of funny when I watched it back in the day. Uh, Jonathan says yes. Just a few pearls. Oh, for like for the accessory. Did you want me to run a poll for that? Can I run two polls at one time? No. Oh really? I don't I'd think have so. to close it out. Are you sure? I mean, maybe. Oh, I know. I can't. You're right. Yeah. All right. Well, I guess we'll have to. We'll have to wait. Uh, Light Lolly, it says Lord of the Rings. Good choice. <laughs> Sherlock movies. 
by RDJ, The Fall, and Kiki's Delivery Service. Oh, you just rewatched that. You said you liked that a lot. Um, last year, I had like a reawakening with Kiki's because I realized at, when I first watched it, I was in high school, and it was like right after I watched Spirited Away and Howl's Moving Castle. So I think I was putting this level of fantasticalism to uh, Miyazaki's movies. So Kiki's didn't deliver on that. And I think that's why I kind of dismissed it because of my ignorance at that time. But now that I'm much older uh, watching it, I realize Kiki's is about so much more and it's about like balancing work and life and finding that comfortable middle ground. And uh, when you lean too far one way, uh, wh what happens, especially being too involved in your work. And I thought it was just a beautiful way of depicting it and how she literally loses her magical powers because she's working so much and I think for me as an artist I feel that sometimes if I'm overworking myself I think the act of creating then becomes joyless in a way and I think Kiki's was a beautiful way of representing that with magic and showing that she's literally losing her magical abilities to perform and uh, it's kind of a good reminder of you know do what you love but make sure you're doing it with uh, boundaries EJ Dara says, oh, the, um, Emily, the one you showed Emily. me, Emily, I liked that. That should be my top five too. There's so many movies. Yeah. You really liked Emily. I liked that one a lot. Spirit Emily's Away, great. A Tale of Two Sisters, Lord of the Rings trilogy, and Singing in the Rain. You know what's oh. funny about Lord of the Rings is mm. I only, what, what was it last year or the year before? 2020 or 2021? What? Lord of the Rings when we watched it with the extended it versions. Was, um, twenty that was twenty twenty, I wanna say. Uh I haven't watched the Lord of the Rings movies. I saw them when I was a kid with my dad in the theaters, but like I barely remember them. And then I haven't seen them all the way through till I was what, thirty one. Uh and I don't know why I just wrote them off of like, oh yeah, they're kind of like high fantasy, but not really for me. And then we we watched them because Josh wanted me to watch the extended versions. I think The Fellowship of the Ring is a 10 out of 10 fantasy movie. To me, that is like perfect fantasy depicted uh, in what in the very much high fantasy arc. Because I also really love movies like Legend, which is definitely a little more silly fantasy. Not even silly. Like they took it seriously, but more like like petals flowing all the time and What's pollen those? in the air at every scene that you're watching. What was that one really cute one we watched? Um... Willow? Willow, yeah, I like Willow. Willow. I mean, yeah. I love fantasy films, and I think to me, Fellowship of the Ring, I found this like new love for uh, fantasy through it. Uh, out of the three, I actually do think the first one's the best. The second one, I think, it kind of goes in the order. So first, second, and third. I thought the third was out of the three the weakest, but still good. Uh, but the first one, I thought, just hit hit it on the head so well. Let's see. Oh, I have, everyone's throwing their stuff in, which is great. Yay. Corinne Sue says, I have a somewhat eclectic taste. Casablanca is number one. That is a really good movie. Princess Bride. Love that movie, too. <laughs> and then Spirited Away. I wouldn't say that that's yeah. eclectic. I, I think like that. if it's like films that no one's ever heard of before, like if you were like Woodshock. Well, and... I think it's such a like, these are three very different movies, though, because Casablanca... And then Princess, I guess Princess Blanc and Princess Bride are in the same vein of romance. Princess Bride being more comedy. And then Spirited I mean, Away being... All three of them kind of have this level of epicness to them, though. When you think I love, about it. Yeah. Uh, Casablanca is like one of those... I mean, if we're talking older films, it's definitely a great classic movie. Soundtrack's good. I think if, if you are okay with watching older films, because a lot of times they don't have as flashy cinematography and, you know... I, I personally love them because they rely on the writing so much more heavily than nowadays, where nowadays you can get away with like flashy, colorful things. But back in the day, they relied almost solely on writing. Uh, I love the movie called All About Eve. So if you're okay watching older films, to me, that's like one of the best ones. Uh, definitely Citizen Kane, but that one's a little harder to watch. Uh, but I, I think it's amazing. I really want to... You've not seen Gone with the Wind yet either. Surprisingly, that's I haven't surprising. seen Gone with the Wind. Gone with the Wind's... I mean, but that's like a four-hour commitment. And it's so weird. I know but... so much about it just from 
context or like out of context. And I, I like Scarlet O'Hara. Uh, I like North by Northwest. Uh, what was I just watched another older film? Oh, Rear Window. I thought it was pretty good. So I think older films, if you're more of a fan of good writing, I actually think older films tend to take the cake on that one over modern ones. Not to say there haven't been good modern ones. Every now and then I'll be like, that was phenomenal. And I think part of it is I'm I'm so used to expecting poor writing in modern movies that when like a good written movie comes out, I'm like, oh wow, that's right. I forgot films can be well written and be dazzling and like beautiful. Um... Dynasty says Brie Antoinette. Really, the Kirsten Dunst one. The 2006 one, there. That was. I saw that one in high school, but I remember not liking it that I much. Sophia Coppola isn't my one number one fave, but I return to it very often when I need it. It's gorgeous <laughs> and interesting, but feels very simple. I'd have to rewatch that one because I do like Kirsten Dunst, and I like the aesthetic that Marie Antoinette had, but I, I do remember not caring for it that much. But that was also in high school. I also didn't like. Kiki's, and then I ended up really loving Kiki's now that I watched it on older. Um, let's see what else we got here. Nick, uh, Jonathan says, low two. We spoke of this before. L O U two. Do you know what that means? Where is it? Jonathan, right there. I haven't seen it. Actually, I don't remember what this. Oh, Last of Us Part Two. Oh, yes. oh, wait, was, were you talking about that earlier or something? Okay, I was like, I don't Damn. know, a movie called Low 2. Uh, of course, <laughs> Last of Us 2. Yeah, it, it just, it didn't hit what I wanted. Uh, or I wouldn't even say it. That sounds like I, I needed it to hit something that I wanted. Uh, I thought the violence was too much. I thought it really glorified violence in that game. And it was literally the first game I had to actually turn off playing because I thought it, it was too much. It was too much for me. Maybe because I'm older and they say that you become a little bit more uh, sympathetic in terms of seeing senseless death or like senseless violence starts to affect you more the older you get. And I know I've definitely seen some things, especially the gun violence in America, especially pre-COVID. Yeah, it kind of became unsettling for me after a while. I'm like, God, like, this just sucks. And then um, I hot take. I do, I flipped my opinion because when I was in high school, I was like, oh, you know, media doesn't affect violence in the real life, but I think I'm now the opposite. I do think seeing all of this does desensitize us to some level, and I think then things like gun violence becomes normalized, and uh, I do think media, I know we, they say you can't blame the media, but like, what is it, the life imitates art? I don't know. Uh, I Not a fan. Him. These kids nowadays. <laughs> right. I mean, that could be more of a personal opinion, but it's something I've noticed. It's hard for me to play games nowadays where it feels like senseless violence because I feel like I'm engaging with it on some level. Oh, yeah. Oh, excuse me. Uh, Nicole EKM says, uh, number one is Perfume, two, A Knight's Tale, three, V for, v for Vendetta. Oh, I like V for Vendetta. Perfume was one of my friends Sonia's favorite movies. She always recommended it, but I, I, I never saw it. Never Here it's it. good though. Have you? No. No. Oh. <laughs> so I can't really judge. Although anybody. you question that, like you've never seen you've it. Never seen that movie. What? <laughs> Couldn't add that to the list though. Oh, cause it's a, is it like a mystery. I'm pretty sure. Yeah. Good, like, like a good. Wait, I don't think I've seen it in Night's Tale either. What, with Heath Ledger? Nope. Actually, that's one of Cat's favorite movies ever. I would totally watch Night's Tale with you. Yeah, I don't think I've seen that one. Well, I'll add it to the list. All right, next we have... Oh, well, was Light Lolly, it says, I forgot to mention the new Little Woman movie by Sarai's... I cannot say that name. Ronan? Saoirse Ronan. Sure. No. <laughs> Wait, what were you just saying? That's how... Sunrise? <laughs> what? Next tip. How do you say... That name is... I will bet you money it's Saoirse. Saoirse? Saoirse Ronan. It's very yeah, Irish. I don't... That Saoirse. Way... Oh, God. Could you imagine if people are watching and be like, no, Tim, you're wrong. Sunrise. 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 Sunrise, Ronan. You did not say sunrise? 
I ended up liking it way more than I anticipated. Yeah, I actually love it. I, I like agree. Little Woman. I, I think Little Woman was better than what I was expecting. The '90s one was really good, but it's I don't know. I thought the new I thought one people was really didn't cute. like the '90s one. I like the '90s one. I don't know. I only heard Carrie talk about it. Well, Carrie's like you with things sometimes. Carrie is very yeah. specific. I actually like the '90s one though. I thought it was pretty good. Um, Tigel says there's this amazing cute game, Two of Us, and it's amazing. Oh, that's the one that won the awards. Thing. Oh, me and Josh want to play that together. Yeah. Oh, that's right. It's... Why haven't we started that? Uh, we could try it out sometime. I would try. I yeah. would definitely play it. But there's one moment where you need to. But Tigel, I feel like this is spoilers. There's one don't moment. Don't say it. To... Okay, don't say it. I don't want to know. Okay, well I saw it. I guess we'll just have to wait and see each other. Don't be spoiling us, Digital. Don't be Jonathan, spoiling us. Jonathan says, love to hear your thoughts on The Lighthouse and Arrival. <gasps> I loved Lighthouse. <laughs> like I said, I think my taste definitely is more for like the uniqueness of a film sometimes. I think I do have a bias towards that, and I can admit it. Uh, Lighthouse I thought was great. Um, specifically, the... The setting, you it's felt the entire time, and the aesthetic, you felt like you're in this gritty world. And I thought Robert and William did such a great job portraying the two uh, lighthouse keepers, and like the arc of the craziness. And then the I won't say the what happens in the end, but there is a specific sound that I can't unhear. I will forever hear the noise, and it was such a good unsettling oh gosh movie. i know what you're talking right? about right yeah uh so i and but i also really like the director he also did the i call it the witch uh the it looks like two v's but it's called the witch uh, i really like the witch a lot it's one of my favorite depictions of a witch i've ever seen especially when you see i actually you know what i won't say that either spoiler um but his new movie the norseman that's why i'm excited for it but i i haven't seen a trailer so for all i know uh i don't even know what it's about uh, it could be horrible, but or a horrible like trailer, but I wouldn't even know. And then what was the other movie? Arrival. Uh, is that the one with Amy Adams? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I really liked uh, Arrival. I think it does a good job at explaining how what was what it called phonics or what's the Hook learning a language. <laughs> I, on. No, get out of here. Um, I loved how it went into understanding a language and how to communicate with. In this case, it was aliens. Uh, I think I've done a really good job at showing that relationship and that uh, miscommunication and that struggling to find ways of uh, understanding one another. And to me, it was also kind of a overarching theme of understanding other people. I thought it was supposed to have a mes message that was deeper than just like a sci-fi communication movie. I thought it was supposed to show how we have this lack of understanding um in other people or like a lack yeah a lack of understanding with other people and how to bridge those communication barriers that we often have with people uh it can be difficult and frustrating linguistics thank, you, thank yeah. you uh so yeah i thought both those were great and uh the director of the arrival what's his name can you google this really quick i already have it up i just trying to remember if I, I don't think i've seen this movie what? I oh. don't remember seeing this. Because Josh likes sci-fi more than I do. Dennis Villeneuve, he did the new Dune, but he also did the Blade Runner 2024, which I liked the visuals in that. We oh, haven't yeah. seen Dune yet, but I am I think I'll like it. I needed Sicario. 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 I haven't seen Sicario. But he's a director that... Oh, he did Prisoners. I like Prisoners. Uh, he's a director that likes to take his time with a scene and really lets you feel the world that the characters are in. And Arrival is definitely more modern, but definitely Blade Runner. And from what I hear about Dune, it's kind of the same feeling as Blade Runner, where it the camera lets you sit in an atmosphere for a while, but you really feel like you're in that world, which is great. Like I said, I can talk about movies for hours. Yes. Which is great. All right. I feel like you're now getting better too with uh, wanting to talk about movies. I I do for the most part. Yeah, I would agree. Just uh, to make sure. 
new pearls. Okay, here we are. <laughs> here we are, and silence. Okay, I found it. <laughs> I said it ahead of time just because I thought I was going to find it when I was saying that. Jen says, I have an overdeveloped sense of secondhand embarrassment. It makes movie watching torture. Embarrassment is a low ball for humor by writers. I love artistry, music, and writing in movies. Okay, if we're talking secondhand embarrassment, um, I've been watching a lot of these cringe videos. I had to stop watching, though, because I was like, these. this is actually like bad. Uh, but there are people that fake mental illnesses on TikTok. And, oh boy, it is... It is. Some of them are hard to watch. Like there will oh, be wow. compilation videos of like people faking that they have Tourette's or something. And not only is it wildly inappropriate and kind of disgusting, but it is cringy. So, yeah, secondhand cringe embarrassment is for sure real. Well, what's it called too? When people have, what do they call that? The multiple personality thing. DID. It's DID or whatever. Yeah, it was DID where people mm -hmm. were faking that though. And it was like, their their characters are different anime characters. Or just things that aren't, it was just strange. Well, apparently, I did, I did do a little bit of research. Apparently, that can happen where you could have like a, a different personality that's like a fictitious one. But they say it, it's, so, it's rare. And apparently, every 14-year-old on TikTok that has DID has just a bunch of fictional characters. Yeah, like, that's so interesting. Probably not. I say out of context, people are like, oh, you guys are making fun of people at this, but... The videos are very obvious that it's for views. We and it's taking a very serious problem and making it like it's a a cute, quirky thing to have. I was talking to Sean about this too. It's kind of sad because I think a lot of these kids, I mean, they're they're too young. They don't really know like the amount of damage they might be doing with videos like this. But what's sad is a lot of them might feel the need to defend themselves if they start getting comments that are like, you have to prove it or whatever. So they might double down on faking it. Oh, And then it's so sad because if they're only 14, I mean, geez, imagine if you had to go through that as a freshman in high school. Not only are you dealing with like being a freshman in high school, but then you're also dealing with this online community attacking you for faking an illness. I mean, I still think it's wrong. Like you shouldn't be doing it. I think the issue too is we can't make we're turning sometimes mental illness into a personality trait. And I think we need to learn to work on fixing the problems so that it becomes something that isn't prevalent. It's something that you can just manage. Like, well, I don't know. For myself, when I was diagnosed with things, I wanted to fix it right away as best as I could. So I don't have to deal with it, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. Where now I feel like some people kind of treat it as like it's something that they have to make a part of themselves and it's like no you don't have to it's it's gonna be there but you can also constantly work on it it takes work but when i think it's becoming like romanticized on tiktok in a way it's like that's not at all healthy i mean i feel like especially mental health is such a hot topic issue um and i think a lot of people might be more sensitive or uh maybe they don't even care about this kind of a topic but Everyone's going to go on their own journey of like discovery and growth. And I'm not going to he be here and like say one thing's better than the other. But I do agree. I do think a lot of people, it seems like the movement is for um, wearing it as like a badge of honor rather than having it as like a awareness uh, thing. And I know my best friend Kat, she always talks about how uh, she's a personal trainer and she posts a lot of stuff about how when she was in her early 20s, uh, she used to have an anxiety or uh, not anxiety, uh, bulimia and anorexia pretty bad. And or I don't think it was that much on bulimia, but definitely anorexic. And yeah. she says, you know, this was a mental thing that I had to confront. I had to take actions from it. And I had to grow from it. And I had to take the steps necessary to, you know, pull myself out of that dark place. And she's like, I don't see myself as that person anymore. And I think it still upsets her sometimes when people still push her into that box where she's like I was but that was like 10 years ago I'm strong and I'm fit now and uh, I think I want to be an example of m not only having something but moving past it taking actions and then have it be in your past you know so I don't know this is that's a whole issue oh yeah that... back to movies but yeah. <laughs> the lighter topic right, the lighter topic <laughs> um 
you this red wrong says when a fiction has something too problematic, I give it zero out of 10 right away. Example, unpopular opinion. Perfect Blue has a brilliant approach, but the way they beautified rape was not for me. I mean, definitely another hot subject matter. I don't think I've ever read Perfect Blue. No, I showed you Perfect Blue. Oh, that's right. Okay. Yeah. Um, I like Perfect Blue, but I also really like Satoshi Khan, the director and the, the artist. Uh, I, I'll agree with you, though. It Those scenes were wildly uncomfortable. And I think the movie would have been better had they taken it out. I think in the 2000s, I think shock value was starting to really go on the rise. And I think that movie kind of fell into that trend with it. I wouldn't automatically rate a movie 0 to 10 for something that's considered problematic today. Uh, but I do think it's something that we can have discussion over. And I think that's something to be aware of moving forward of like, we shouldn't be doing stuff like that. But there was a lot that I think worked outside of those scenes in Perfect Blue. And I think like someone slowly losing um, their sense of stability and who they are as a person. I thought it was uh, drawn really beautifully in a lot of the parts. Uh, but yeah, I mean, that's how I kind of fell about Belladonna of Sadness. I mean, if you didn't like Perfect Blue, you're going to hate that movie. <laughs> just hate it. Because they really indulge in a lot of that stuff where I'm like, this is just uncomfortable. Like, this is just not for me. Um, but yeah, I get it. I, I know what you mean. There are some things where I watch it. I mean, kind of like how I felt with Last of Us 2 where I'm like, I just, I'm this isn't for me. You know, it's just not for me Too anymore. much, yeah. Um, FG says, you should watch Shameless absolutely out of the box. I watched the first two seasons. Wait, did that. you see it? Yeah, not all of them, but I did see some of the seasons. I like the show. I haven't Very seen it dysfunctional yet. family, but I actually the characters you even the not so like great characters you still kind of like them. Um, Ash says, "How long did it take you to develop your art style?" I mean, my whole life, but it's such a vague answer i guess i started doing more pencily stuff when i was like my mid-20s but i feel like my style and everyone's style is definitely an amalgamation of everything that they are attracted to throughout their career of drawing and doing art where i have picked up so many things along the way and a lot of it was influenced when i was a kid like kingdom hearts and final fantasy and then you know meeting artists like alan williams and finding artists like norman rockwell and Muka and harry clark that you're just Frankensteining everything that you are attracted to visually into a medium. And for me, I would say my style, I guess, really took form, if we want to call it that, when I was like 27. Yeah, so I think people would now say I have a, a distinct style and it's, it focuses a lot on contrast and uh, value placement. Kind of have this wispy, uh, kind of fantastical lighting to it. And... Yeah, I would say about 27. Uh, Oscar says, yeah, I, I got to catch up to me. So glad to hear someone else express it openly. I feel like all this forced representation. This one, we were talking about that. So oh, yeah. yeah, we're a little behind. Just has the opposite effect of what it set to do. Also poorly written, straight out stereotypical. Totally agree. I think for me, it's personally to a lot of gay characters i just don't relate to they make them either super sexual or they they can never have healthy i don't know there's always I'm trying to think of like a good example i guess of one that was good of like a good depicted gay character well i think that's the thing too it's like i don't need to mm, i don't need a character i think to be like gay modern to family to or something like that where it was like a healthy gay couple i guess <gasps> I mean, I'm trying to think if of you like... want if you want a good depiction of like a gay person without it being like yes, honey, gay, uh, a single man. Literally, I would. Oh, yeah. That would also be one of the movies that teeters on my top five favorites. It's called A Single Man, and it's directed by Tom Ford, who's a fashion designer. Go figure. He could actually direct a movie as well. So he's successful in basically saving Gucci, but <laughs> then he's also successful as a filmmaker, and he also made Nocturnal Animals. Oh, yeah. I wish he would focus more like in film one. because I think he's such a good filmmaker. I, I, 
I am excited for him to make more stuff, but I, I think things are still um like he always takes a while between each project, which is fair. I mean everyone's entitled to do what they want their life, but I think he's so good. But a single man, my favorite depiction of a gay person in film. And especially a, a main character being the gay character. And honestly, if you wouldn't even really know about his relationship, you probably wouldn't even know he's gay because he is very much like a straight laced type person and they don't see being gay as like uh a vice or as like a weakness and they it just they just happen to be gay and, and this is like filmed in like the 60s or the the setting is in the 60s or 70s too and i i love how they depict it so yeah that'd be my my number one um <laughs> janisha says first tinkerbell movie gave me chills the yeah. tinkerbell series is good because they go in depth of how their powers work and all the characters are great i actually really like i like the tinkerbell movie too and I hear the one with the beast is pretty good. Oh my god, it's been so long. I forgot what the one guy's name was. The beast. Her little boyfriend. No, her boyfriend. Tinkerbell has a boyfriend. Yeah, she gets a boyfriend. Too. Scandal. <laughs> I like the Tinkerbell movies. Okay. Um. Elena says, "Lord of the Rings are my all-time favorite movie series, and for me, the order is three, two, one, from best to least favorite, even if great." <gasps> you thought the third one was the best? I feel like there are specific moments in the third one that like took it down a notch for me. Specifically, Legolas sliding down whatever that creature was leg to me was so cringy. Oh, the elephant sort of. Well, and the like elephant. he does like the I forgot what he does at the end. Like he lands, like sticks the landing. I'm like, what the hell was that? Oh, I know you. Uh... I don't. Although I'm not a fan of green screen, and when movies become too digitally focused where the first lord of the rings felt i felt like i was in new zealand you gotta admit for that era with green screen though they did pretty good oh it was good yeah well yes because that was early 2000s. well i don't know that legless slide was pretty cringy that could just know. be me but i i'm also not a big fan of like war movies uh especially when it's like good guy bad guy and we're just gonna like have a 30 minute fight scene I get why a lot of people like that, and I, I get why fight scenes could be super well choreographed, and uh, they're more intricate probably than I'm even even aware of. And to be honest, I'm so ignorant with uh, battling and like fighting styles that there's probably a lot going over my head that uh, I'm not able to appreciate. Uh, so maybe that's why I didn't like the second and third one as much as the first one, but I just, I loved the first one. And I was kind of upset that, kind of a spoiler, but not really, Gandalf doesn't actually die. For someone that didn't read the books, and I, uh, I, I actually was like, "Oh my God, he died!" Like sacrificing himself. Oh. I felt that emotional pull. <laughs> so then, when the second movie, he's like, "I'm back, but not really. But I'm actually just gonna be called a different name." I'm like, "Get out of here!" Like you had me. Like, you gotta you... give in. To, just give in to the little bit of like fun fantasy parts like that, Tim. I think it's you get it's all stuff like... like that where I oh yeah plot armor. I'm a super. Not fan not, of... They're not all going to be like a French film, Tim. No, but the first one I thought was it's 10 out of 10. Gonna... Okay. First one I thought was 10 out of 10. Uh, and I thought that like... Because Gandalf died and you're like, oh my gosh, like this is going... It's going there. I like when movies uh, depict actions having consequences. But it's based off a book. So what's the movie supposed to do? Not have Gandalf stay alive? Well, then I'm also critiquing the book as well. <sighs> Sorry, J.R.R. Right, Tolkien? Yeah. Uh, rest in peace. But I like when movies, when they, they show, like, Gandalf sacrificing himself, I feel like sacrificing himself used to mean something. <laughs> Where nowadays it's like, especially in, like, Game of Thrones, just like, oh, it's just just move on to the next scene and then the next scene that we have those characters in, they'll just be fine. We won't really explain why they're fine, but they're, they're fine. And I'm like, oh, that plot armor be thick. And I remember watching Arcane in December, and I kind of got that same vibe of, like, the plot armor was so thick in so many instances where, like, a bomb would go off in front of two characters that are standing right in front of a bomb. Oh, yeah. And one of them had a sprained ankle, and the other seemed fine. And I was like, what? I, I To me, that's where I'm like, I, it takes me out. I'm like, uh, then anything could happen. Like, someone could fall 200 feet and be fine, and they'll just move on, you know? Unless if that's the world they live in, where you could do stuff like that and get away with it. 
like Scott Pilgrim, someone mentioned that earlier, like you could get super punches and crazy fight scenes and someone could fall from like 100 feet. And in that world, it kind of fits. I guess, yeah. You know, anyways, ramble. Mm -hmm. <laughs> did <laughs> White Lolly, it says, did you all watch the old Barbie movies? No. I think I saw... Back when I used to babysit. Oh my god, what was the one? There's so many Barbie movies. Oh, I'm sure, especially now. I can't even probably find the one I watched. I know I watched one, but I can't even remember. Uh, Felix says I get super excited when I find movies I haven't uh, heard of that seem like I would like them. Unfortunately, most of the time there's a reason you haven't heard of it yet. <laughs> <laughs> there's some there are a few Tim always goes on what is it, Criterion Collection or whatever you have oh yeah Ruby, my... all those I mean if any of you have Critiquer it's like a online um, movie rating collection database and that's where I put all my movie ratings so if you ever want to see like what my top 50 are or what my least favorite 50 are because uh, you can rate it 0 to 100 kind of like Rotten Tomatoes but uh, what I like about Critiquer, Kyle showed us this, uh, they'll recommend movies to you based on the movies that you've given ratings to before. So I find a lot of new films from Critiquer, and I'm like, oh, I've, I've never heard of it, like add to watch list. So maybe that's something you should do uh, if it's hard for you to find new films that are like in the vein of films that you like watching. So anyways. Um... Jen says, my favorite movies are All About My Mother, Spirited Away, and The Land Before Time. All of these have made me cry. Haven't heard about All About My Mother. Oh, Spirited Away, though. It's so good. Spirited Away is easily a masterpiece. Yeah. 1999. Keeping that one in the little tab there. Um, Tefalina says, I love musicals. So my faves are The Sound of Music, The King and I, The Greatest Showman, Beauty and the Beast, the animated version, and Annie. Oh, I've not watched King and I in so long either. Same with Sound of Music. I've not watched that probably since I was a kid, honestly. I remember loving it, though. I, after the stream's over, I'll share with you uh, this thing on Pinterest where, because I love, Beauty and the Beast is my favorite Disney movie, that or Treasure Planet. And, uh... I found out that Beauty and the Beast, they keep restoring it and they keep colorizing it with like each iteration. So when they went from like VHS to DVD and then DVD to Blu-ray, they keep color correcting and it has gotten so much worse over the years. Where in the VHS, the original Beauty and the Beast, her dress, like an example, the picture that they use is like the beast and her dancing in the ballroom. Her dress used to be like this very muted, gold, warm, rich color. And then you show on the DVD, it becomes a little more like yellowish, but still kind of a warmer hue. And then the Blu-ray, it is like piss yellow, <laughs> like bright yellow. And they think they're color correcting, but I'm like, you are destroying the colors in this movie. And I don't know why. I don't know if you're trying to make it more colorful, so it's more appealing and to kind of stand against modern movies that are so rainbow in everything they do, especially animated movies. It's just like plethora of color all the time. Uh, but I kind of miss the faded old color palettes that old movies used to have, specifically um, Don Bluth films. So think more like Secret of Nim and uh, kind of American Tale. But I even, love American Tale. It, American Tale is pretty good. Oh. But a lot of those old animated movies had color palettes that I thought not only were more digestible for me, but they they set a tone so much better than a lot of modern animated films. So. Yeah, if you could, I'll I'll find the picture on Pinterest that shows the comparison of what they've done to Beauty and the Beast over the years, but four line shocking. Mm -hmm. All right, so we move on to Oscar says tips on how to draw jaws. Don't tell me to study skulls. I struggle with <laughs> finding the angle or um, art list. I think what it might be typo. I just can't figure out what word that is. To make it consistent when trying to draw the same character. 
just tips on how to draw jaws without stunning skulls. I mean, I kind of do the, the classic sphere and then you pull it down to like a, I don't even know what kind of a shape this is, like a box shape. So it looks more like that. And then if you can ball, draw those two shapes, you should be able to draw a jaw kind of any direction. Uh, but obviously everyone's going to have a different jaw shape. And as much as I, I know you said don't recommend it, but like, yeah, studying a skull would be good. But honestly, I would just purposely find images on Pinterest that are very much focused on like jaw lines and just sketch them for practice and try to do no more than like three to five minutes on each sketch and only focus on the jaw. So like don't focus on the eyes and the details around the mouth. Like only focus on how you're capturing the jawline. And then I know one of the things I did in school is you draw a face facing forward and then you have to draw it like angled like 10 degrees and then another 10 degrees, another 10 degrees. And then you go back to the middle and then you do 10 degrees up, up, up and then down, down, down. And then then you do like angles. So that was like a really good test of like drawing a head at any different angle and then going with it. Actually, Josh, let me go to the bathroom really quick. Okay. Before I that. So maybe you want to talk about your piano really quick? Uh, talk about my piano. Um, I've been playing the piano every day. I don't, I don't know what, what he wants me to talk about with the piano. And I'm making a song. I'm playing... I'm learning how to play Somewhere Over the Rainbow. So that's really my piano story. It's been fun. I'm enjoying playing piano again. I used to do that a lot um, growing up. So it's just fun to play piano again. We got our piano tuned, so we actually have a normal... I hate playing on digital keyboards. So it's really nice just to have an actual piano to play on now. They sound so much better. The keys play nicely. So I do enjoy that. I saw someone mentioning The Hobbit... I wish he says I like the Hobbit movies. Uh, see, I think I probably would have enjoyed the Hobbit movies more if I didn't read the book. Because I think I had such a connection with the Hobbit book. Um, I liked the... The Hobbit book was so much of a lighter read than Lord of the Rings too, And it just felt like this really fun journey and adventure. Um, it didn't feel as doom and gloom as Lord of the Rings was. So I feel like the Hobbit movies to me were just really intense. In terms of compared to the book, it just felt like this crazy storyline. Or when I read the book, it's just this simple adventure that Bilbo goes on. So changed up. Oh, hello, Tam. Ooh. Okay, okay. Sorry about that. Um, I didn't really know what to talk about the piano, but I said we got it tuned. I've been playing it every day. Mm-hmm. And that's about it. <laughs> oh, and hopefully we'll see some more original songs and time lapses from us on YouTube. Yes. Question mark? That's the plan. <laughs> um, all right. I jumped to one about the Hobbit movie because I... Oh, yeah. Josh told me not to watch the Hobbit movies. Um. Well, I was just saying because someone says they enjoyed them. I uh, wish he said... And I just said, I think if I didn't read the book, maybe I would have enjoyed it a little bit more. But I think because I have such an attachment to the the book, it's just weird to um, see the movie. Yeah, you really like the book. Isn't that your favorite book? Yeah, that's one of my favorite books. One of or the favorite? Probably the favorite. I've read The Hobbit so many times now. Jen said, out of been way more interested in the del toro version of the hobbit movies he was gonna do I the agree. hobbit i didn't even know that i'm not sure i don't know if wow. that's just more like a i wish del toro did oh wait oh yeah oh interesting he actually was gonna do it Wow. Actually, that would have been interesting because I think he probably would have brought more of a creature heavy focus. Yeah. Probably made the world feel a little bit more kind of the 80s fantasy vibe, I would think. I don't know. I don't know actually what Del Toro would have done with it. Right. Um, 
let me catch up though because i think there's people up here i missed though um elena says my top three movies are lord of the rings return of the king spirited away and spider-man into the spider-verse oh okay i like that one we watched that one in theaters right with the, all the roommates at the time yeah spider-verse was great that was a cool and like typically i'm i had disdain superhero movies but that one actually was like no it's good that was good and i think we're gonna see a lot more of that style of animation pop up uh i think even arcane you see like this different si style of animation where everything was looking very cookie cutter uh like gloom lighting everywhere and it kind of had this pixar effect where every animation studio kind of adopted it as their own and, like every animated movie kind of looks the same nowadays so that's why when inner the spider verse comes out or even arcane the style uh, differentiation is so strong that I think it stands out for like good reasons. And I think Spider-Verse was uh, the first one that like really set the tone of, hey, animation doesn't have to look like this one way that you're used to. So that was a really great uh, kind of alternative look at what animation can be in the digital modern era. Oh, apparently Del Toro, Jen says he was planning to do all of them he did a lot of work that was all scrapped two years of work <gasps> Ugh. oh wow i had no idea that he was even going to be involved with those because i think peter jackson did a good job i mean he in a way peter jackson created Lord the visual Rings. world for Lord of the Rings. so you would think all oh, the hobbit he would have that same respect but that almost makes sense because if Peter Jackson wasn't actually going to be doing it and all of a sudden last minute, oh, my laptop battery just died. <laughs> um, last minute was going to do it, then that would make sense why they probably felt weird too because he probably had Peter Jackson was given a lot less time to even plan than too. I mean, that totally makes sense um, of why they might be a little less in quality versus Lord of the Rings in a lot of people's mm -hmm. minds. I haven't seen them, so I, I don't have an opinion on it. Maybe we'll just, I mean, they're wintery movies to watch. We could just watch them, just so you can see them. And then you can develop kind of an opinion on them then, too, compared yeah. to Lord of the Rings, because I'd be interested to see what you say. Um, people are raving about Dune. We really need to see that still. Mm -hmm. I'm surprised we haven't watched it. I don't know why we've put it off. Well, we wanted to go see it in the theater, because everyone's telling us to watch it in the theater. But it's December was crazy busy. Um, Jen says a criticism towards games like excuse me The Last of Us I read and agree with is that the games want to be movies but the way where they take moments from other movies TV series and just imitates The Last of Us I've read and agree with yeah is that the games want to be like movies um, where they take moments from other movies, TV series, and it just imitates. It's kind of like a hodgepodge of different tropes, in a way. And it's so weird, because I think visually, Last of Us 2 is stunning. I think it's a very well-crafted movie, and even there will be times where, like, you step in someone's blood in snow, and then your next step, it would, like, slowly lose how much blood per step. Like, that level of artistry on the back end, I think, is so impressive. And that's why I don't Whenever I talk negatively about something, I think I also have to give it credit where credit's due. And I think these are still people working on it, and there's a lot to be said. But when it comes to, like, games trying to feel like movies, I'm not super against it. Because, like, I actually really enjoyed Uncharted uh, 4, and that was definitely, like, a movie in, like, a game format. And then even... Uh, well, no, Edith Finch was definitely a game. Yeah, I don't know. I guess that is a good discussion to think about. I thought I, I felt like I had a good answer to it, and then as I was talking, I was like, well, I can kind of see the problems with it, too. Oh, I guess, like, one of the problem games was Heavy Rain. I liked Heavy Rain, mind you, but I think they were trying to make it too much like a movie, and the, the actual gameplay of Heavy Rain wasn't really present. Like, you kind of walked, you, like, but you like those kind of games a lot. I mean, your Edith Finch is basically that too. Technically, like, there's no Edith Finch. Play, really, when you think about it. I mean, I do think Edith Finch is like 10 out of 10. Yeah. Technically, though, Edith Finch is like one of those games where 
the environment and the story are the focus, and those were such 10 out of 10 that the gameplay elements, although the gameplay elements were shifting because every story that you heard, it was like a different way of playing it, even if it was like a short little dumb game, like how to swing on a swing, or you're in a bathtub and you're controlling the duck. You know, it's like they're different. I don't think that's gameplay. I mean, it's cute, but it's not really like gameplay necessarily. It's kind of just... Well, how do you define gameplay? Um, I think it's... That's down the water. I know, because I have to think how I explain this. It's... Gameplay to me is mechanics that are fun and you learn and improve on. I guess. Where I don't think Edith Finch to me is not really a gameplay. It is kind of a movie, but it's okay. It's still good. I mean, I'm not fully disagreeing with you. Yeah. But I do think Edith Finch did have gameplay elements. Not to the extent like an RPG, like an action game or... But then I would even argue some of those games you're just button mashing. And like there is no element of thinking. Oh, you know what? Okay. Because you're right. Okay, here's how we can think about it more. Like, League of Legends or MOBAs. Like, we've been playing a lot of Pokemon Unite. That gameplay is what intrigues me to that, and that's why we play it so much. That's the reason you play it, yeah. It's literally like a live-action, fast-moving chess game. So, to me, that's gameplay. Edith Finch, yes, there are gameplay elements, but there's no level of competition. There's no level of, like, bettering. You're playing for the story. You're playing for the story. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, that was a long answer. I don't really know what we were trying to come up with <laughs> from all that, but diverged yeah. a little <laughs> bit. Um, Ella says how casually Tim offends like a third of all people on Earth. Oh yeah, this is when you were talking about Gandalf. Tim would have preferred. Jen says Tim would have preferred ah. if Gandalf had died. <laughs> Actually, but yeah, and we would, <laughs> and we had gotten Tom Bombadil instead. I do agree. I wish. Who's Tom Bombadil? You won't know because you never read the book in Lord of the Rings. Ah! But there's a part in Lord of the Rings when they're first leaving the Shire, they have to go through the old forest to get to Bree. So it's weird because in the movie, they remember in the movie, they get in the little boat, cross the river, and all of a sudden they're in Bree, the city. Oh, kind of. Technically, yeah. Bree is like still a full day's journey from crossing that river. So they stayed in a little town next to the river after they crossed at like a little house that Mary and Pippin set up for them. Oh, were and then people they had upset to go about the... this? What? Were people upset about this? Or... I mean, I was because I this like one of my favorite parts of the book. Honestly, it's at the beginning too. And Tom. And they go through name? the old forest where Tom Bombadil lives with his mystical wife. Oh, gotcha. Yeah. Okay. Then yeah, and Tom I would Bombadil have liked to is see like that. this really interesting. I don't know. He's like a an enigma in the world too because he's not. You can't really pinpoint what he, or who he is in a way. Um, hmm. Yeah, cool character. I was hoping, if anything, they'd throw him in the Hobbit movie just because the Hobbit movie was just doing everything they wanted to anyways, but they didn't <laughs> even do it there, so. Oh, did they not follow the book that closely? In the Hobbit? Yeah. Oh, no. It, it followed the, like, this was the plot line, so they kept it at least there, but then they started throwing in, like, a hundred different things along oh. the way. I can see why people would get upset over that then. Yeah. Especially if I like loved The Hobbit. Um, Light Lolly, it says, you don't know the OG 12 dancing princess, Swan Lake, Princess and Popper and such. Have you seen, you've seen Swan Lake, right? Oh yeah. Okay. Wait, what was the question? Though? 12. You don't know the OG 12 dancing princess is, I don't know what that one is. Princess and the Popper. I don't know if I'm understanding this one. Yeah, I don't know if I understand the question. Because I have seen Swan Lake. I don't know. I, I don't think I've seen Twelve know. Dancing Princesses though. Princess and Popper, have you seen? I think I know of it, but I haven't seen it. Uh, Carlos says I would like to see an interview of Dustin Panzino. Ah! <laughs> so Dustin is one of our close friends now. I love Dustin. Uh yeah, I could do an interview with Dustin. Actually, I'll probably do one with Alex eventually, too, because I haven't done one with him. Uh, Ella says the Hobbit movies were rough for me. Everything felt very CGI, and they really pushed everything. 
edit plot twists, oh. love stories, etc. that just distract from the main story. You had Hobbit on in the last in the background one time and I remember being like this is, looks really green screened. Yes. Like really green screened. They didn't film on location like they did for Lord of the Rings. They oh. did some I think on location but most of it was green screen. That's And why. that yeah, it kind of took the charm out of it. And it felt like watching a video game basically with real people in it. <laughs> I've heard it that just, before. Yeah, it was just really weird. I actually got motion sick in some parts, too, because it was almost too much movement. <laughs> it was weird. That's so weird that Del Toro was going to do The Hobbit. Well, apparently he was doing The Hobbit. Yeah. They dropped it. Well, that was 2008. Eight? So when was Pan's Labyrinth came out in what? No, that was like 2001. Pan's Labyrinth released in 2006. What? Yeah. Oh, yeah, because I would have been in, like, seventh grade. So or that's no, weird. School. It would have been right after Pan's Labyrinth. He was actually probably working on it while Pan's Labyrinth wasn't even out yet. Because if it was two years before... Yeah, it was probably right after Pan's Labyrinth. Jeez, that's so weird. Because they started filming in 2008. Interesting. That's, like, the alternate timeline. Maybe we'll <laughs> see it happen sometime. Yeah, I heard about that. Alina says they made Ian McKellen nearly quit because he had to act out the scene at Bilbo's with the dwarfs alone. I remember watching something where they were, some of what? the actors are being honest. And Ian, because he's definitely like a old timey actor too, he did not like, yeah, all the green screen. There's like, I they remember made him do it alone. It was on one of the DVD extras. And you could tell because this was the official Warner Brothers or whatever that was filming it. He's being nicer about it, but he was kind of being like, I am not a big fan of the green screen stuff. Because even some of the outdoor scenes, rocks were in the shape of a green screen. So you knew they were just going to green screen the rock in. Even. <laughs> and I feel like you could just tell he was not enjoying it. Especially probably acting in Lord of the Rings for so long. I couldn't imagine enjoying that whole experience and being outside and experiencing the elements and that immerses you in what you're doing. Oh, hundred percent. And then having to go and just walk into a studio every day. I mean, I do think like the, the opinion about practical versus um, digital effects has shifted back to like practical effects are better. I think Mad Max definitely did the big turning point. Uh, thank you, George Miller for kind of setting that tone. And then, admittedly, even though I didn't really care for the new Star, Star Wars um, sequels, they made it a point to add a lot more practical stuff and, like, build more of the sets. And I think that, in turn, created a lot more uh, visually appealing scenes within the movies themselves. Catch up. I'm here. Um... <laughs> Felix says Hellboy 2 must have been first because Hobbit came out in 2012. He maybe was doing both of them at the same time because it says, hang on. Kind of Hellboy's fun. The he second was hired one. to direct in 2008. So it probably then, you're right, it was right after Hellboy 2 is probably when he started doing Hobbit then. Okay. Strange though. Let's see. Okay, I, I think we're going to go for like another 10 minutes and then we're going to cut off the stream. Okay. So if you guys have any last minute questions, be sure to ask them now. And then, yeah, because I think even with her, I feel like I have it pretty much laid out and then I'll start penciling her probably tomorrow uh, so that we can call this one done. Uh, John says if you watch a few of the recent Lord, Lord of the Rings um, League of Legends trailers, some of the recent trailers are in the same animation style as Arcane. If you want to see something truly unique art-wise, watch the Annie short. Is that the one you were watching the other day? No. Annie was Annie's backstory. Did they make a new Annie short? No, it's the old one. Oh, I like that one a lot. Yeah. Yeah, I love the... All of the... Actually, I love the, the older League of Legends ones. What was the one? Well, oh, speaking of like unique kind of animation films... uh. The stop motion one just came out on Netflix. I think it's called Holmes. Or what's the one that you showed me? The Netflix one with like the animals. <gasps> oh, it's I my laptop died, so I can't even go into my thing to like it. I know what you're talking Dude, so about. I've been though. A Netflix stop motion movie. 
It's a series, right? Oh, it's a series. Oh, I think you're right. The House? The House, I think. Yes. Yeah, film. Uh, I think it came out like a couple days ago, so we're going to give that one a try. Uh, I know we've been talking a lot of movies, so apparently this one's supposed to be a unique kind of quirky movie. So The House. Yeah, it looks good. We'll I'm excited it. for it, for sure. Oscar says, and what about top five story-based video games? Mine Ooh. are Last of Us 1 and 2. Get out of here. Devil May Cry 3 and 4. Detroit Become Human. Killzone series. Just realizing how few games have strong stories. Um, have Wait, you are you reading this? Right here. Okay, so uh, me and my friends joke that a lot of these games are more in like the guy game zone. Uh, they're like, uh, we joke about like manames or like things that are specifically meant for like guy players. I think a lot of these seem like that. Heavy Rain? Yeah, Heavy Rain's plot twist. I did not like the plot twist. Assassin's Agreed. Creed could have been awesome if they skipped the animus from the start. Life is Strange. I like the first Life is Strange a lot. Um, um, I've heard not the mixed things about Detroit Become Human. I haven't played it myself, so I can't say it. I thought Last of Us 1 was incredible. I thought 2 was not great. Uh, I haven't played any of the Double May Cries besides the DMC, the remake, and I couldn't get past the first 10 minutes, um, so I, I can't have an That's honest not, opinion I mean, on that. I just don't think that games, yeah. Like, but I like... Actually, Detroit Become, Detroit Become Human, I watched a streamer play it, and I actually thought it was kind of interesting oh really yeah um dmc oh felix dmc dishonored and diablo a uh, cat loves diablo i haven't played it myself i haven't played dishonored and yeah dmc i only played the first 10 minutes devil could make cry is just not like a kind of that's game. one thing i think i am a little too gay for <laughs> devil may cry <laughs> devil may cry dance um, although some people would argue the opposite of like there's a lot of fanfic between dante and nero and a lot of the male characters. Oh, yeah. I mean, of course, there's we're an underlying. Yeah. I know. Um, I recently started playing in Verbis, Virtus, Virtus. Where? Verbis, Virtus, a puzzle game where you cast Ver magic. Verbis, with... Virtuous. No, it's or no, not Virtuous. Not Virtuous. It's Virtus. Verbis, Virtus. Oh. It's like a tongue twister. Verbis, Virtus, a puzzle game where you cast magic with your mic, which is really fun. I don't think oh, I've that's heard interesting. Of that before. Yeah, I've never heard of that. Hang on a second. I like the sound of that one, though. God, though. Top five story Verbis games. games. Okay. Well, Verbis. for sure, I have to say Final Fantasy X, and especially replaying it, I actually do think it is the best story game I've ever played and possibly will ever play. Um, I'm going to say Edith Finch, or I think the official title is What Remains of Edith Finch. I'm going to put up there. Even though it's a two-hour game, or like two and a half hours, I thought that story was incredible. Man, story-based games. I actually liked Uncharted 4 story, um, but I also liked what they did with the relationship with Nathan and Elena, the wife, and um, the idea of getting too old for what you love to do and how you move to like the next chapter of your life. I like that story art, so maybe I'm biased on that one. Man, other games that I thought the story was like phenomenal. You know, I'm going to put Twist Metal Black in there, even though it's like a bunch of short stories compiled together. Uh, I love those. Um, Because I did not care too much for Final Fantasy XII story. But just a story-based game, though. Like a game like Edith Finch, where it is purely just a story-based game, though. Yeah, but I would consider Final Fantasy X story-based, even though it's an RPG. I guess. Um... That one's tough. <laughs> Oscar says... Uh, not the DMC remake. Oh, okay. Yeah. So then we're on the same page. I haven't played any of the other ones, so I, I don't have an actual opinion on them. <laughs> Felix, Devil May Cry's High Camp Honey. A shirtless guy with platinum hair doing flamboyant flips to fight. Yes? I think my favorite thing, too, is nowadays, you can basically <laughs> just say anything that someone doesn't like. Your People's response can be, oh, it's camp. <laughs> Well, no. This was Granny talking about this on her stream. It was cute. But 
anything that if someone doesn't like something, you can just be like, it's camp. But I kind of agree there is something campy. No, about I actually the game. agree with Felix. I yeah. think it is a campy game. It is campy, I guess. I, I hear the first one, I think Devil May Cry one and two were more serious, but then I think three and four apparently were more ridiculous. They kind of is the fifth one the new one? They like really just amped it up. And even with the remake, apparently it was supposed to be like over the top. So it's like self aware. It's very self aware. Oh, but yeah. it, I think I'm only I'm only ripping on it because basically my straight friends that play video games love Devil May Cry. Like love it. And they're the most like bro not even bro, just like man, like I like to work out. <laughs> I know that that's not specifically straight, but just in my own friend group, like Justin loves Devil May Cry. Zach loves Devil May Cry. My old friend Justin loved Devil May Cry. So guys. Like guys. Yeah. But uh, like I said, my view on it is probably so distorted because of the friends that I have around me that like love Devil May Cry. And they are just... <laughs> The straightest line people I've ever met. So that's been like an inner joke between me and them um, of Devil May Cry. So I, I, you know what? It's not even fair for me to judge it because I think I have such a filter over how I see it. Anyways. All right. Is there any last minute questions? Uh, there's a couple quick things. I'll just read off a bunch of things at once here. We'll do like right. two second comments. Uh, Jen says Tom, Tom Bombadil is specifically a very powerful being. But with clear boundaries, I got the impression that he can only do his thing on his territory. Imagine a very godfather that sings a lot. Yeah, Tom is amazing. Um, I was just mad they put him in the movie. I thought his whole home and his character and everything was really cool. Um, Jen says the overuse of 3D has left a lot of younger people confused on what practical effects actually are. Also true. Um, Felix says DMC is the male Bayonetta. DMC four and five are really <laughs> over the top. I know Bayonetta people always say is like a very campy also kind of game where it's kind of self-aware. Yeah, I haven't played um, that one, so I don't know. Uh, Creative Doof says they look like yin and yang, yin and yang mermaids. That would be a really cool idea. Oh, I mean, yeah, actually. Especially with the contrast and the values here. Um, Oscar says, even though DMC is a brain dead over the top action hack and slash, <laughs> Nero in DMC4 is the most relatable video game character I've ever played as, and his story is great. Um, Ella says, I don't play a lot of games, but I really like the game Oxen Free, and it's art. I would consider that a story based game. You make decisions to continue the story based on, based, continue the story rather than solve levels based on skill yes they also made the newer one that i want to try out i liked oxen free yeah you played that didn't you yeah and they just came out that studio came out the new game pretty recently are they making a oh they're making an oxen Oxen free too this year interesting okay well there you go oh light says i've been obsessed with sky children of the light (laughs) Joshua I loves. love that game. I've not. I don't play it that much though, because I've been all on Final Fantasy fourteen right now. But pretty fun with incredible visuals and music. Gets grindy after a while though. Yeah, it, once you finish the story the first time, it does just turn into kind of the the game grind. <laughs> all right, we're caught up though. Okay. Yeah. Well, I think we're gonna end it there. Yeah, this was a long stream. Uh, yeah. Thank you guys so much for the the lively conversation. It was. It definitely picked my mood up because I definitely was disoriented this morning. Yeah. But uh, here is where we're at with the Queen of Hearts. I definitely am going to have some more fun. I'm going to probably edit it a little bit more tonight, and then I'll post on the Discord, the Patreon one, of what it looks like before I print it and then start penciling it. Uh, thank you guys so much for coming today. And if you want to see more, obviously we have Discord that's a public one that you can join below to keep the conversation going. And then I'll also find that Beauty and the Beast Pinterest picture. Oh, yeah. Uh, and then lastly, if you want to become a Patreon backer, there's a link below too. I post almost every workday on updates on the Mermaid card deck, my Aquatica Nautica five foot drawing that I'm working on, and the tarot series that I'm doing, along with any other drawing. And then also, if you want to become a YouTube member on here, it's I think $2 a month. You get access to, if you want to show the exclusive emojis uh, that you can use during the chat. And uh, oh. yeah, it's much appreciated. And we definitely plan on keeping 
up with doing these weekly schedules. So mind you, a lot of them aren't so much focused on like the art centric or me doing tutorials as much as they are like having a conversation with you guys, uh, having some good times and hopefully giving you something to listen to while you work on Wednesday afternoon or wherever you are. I guess for some of you, it's like nighttime if you're around the world. So thank you again for joining. Uh, like I said, we want to do more video focused stuff and more things where we're connecting with community this year in 2022. And we're going to keep doing that so thank you guys for being a part of it okay cool. so take care everyone do you have yeah. any last minute no much love to everyone oscar love the stream as always good to have you guys here thank you you all add so much to the discussion for us too so um thank you yeah, yeah thank you guys really for fun. the <laughs> the good public discourse and yes. even if there's <laughs> things that there are games or movies that i didn't like that you love and movies that i love that you hate i love that i love being able to have opposing opinions that we can still have like a cordial conversation about it. So thank you guys for engaging with us today. Okay. So take care everyone. Hopefully